The following is a special presentation of the Dustin Geek Podcast. This is the Decibel Geek Podcast with Chris Sanzak and Aaron Camaro. All right, we're back at it once again. The show that just wants to reach out and touch somebody, but they won't let us. This is the Decibel Geek Podcast, quarantine sessions number six. My name is Aaron Camaro, joined as always by my good friend in his car, Chris Sinzak. How's it going? <laughs> Good, man. Back to the car, huh? Yeah, I you know I can't make anything else work from my own home office, so I'm, I'm sitting in my driveway in my car. These are the prices we pay during the quarantine, but the show rolls on as always. Decibel Geek Podcast not going anywhere, but you know what? We've been having a lot of fun doing these quarantine sessions, and we're going to keep it rolling here today. So we've got an awesome special guest. We're going to bring him on in just a minute, but before we get to all the fun and all the awesome questions you guys have submitted for us today, we got to take care of our business, and we're back in business with a sweet review. We only got one, but man... This is something else right here. I This is one of the best reviews that we've gotten in a while, and we get some really great ones, but, man, this is something else. So check this out. It's five stars. It comes to us via Apple Podcasts, and it's entitled Happy 400th Episode, and it goes like this. Congrats to hosts Chris and Aaron on 400 episodes spanning nine years. Lots of hard rock podcasts out there but Decibel Geek remains my favorite. Not just because of the variety, interviews, year-in-review retrospectives, track-by-track album discussions, looks at new bands, music not played on the radio, etc., but because of the creativity. An episode about Alice Cooper's Blackout era could be followed by metal covers of Rush, their top five Bon Scott-era ACDC songs, the heavier side of Pink Floyd, or favorite Aerosmith tunes from the 80s. Not to mention the dozens and dozens of episodes dedicated to the hottest band in the world, KISS! Thanks for all the research you do, the knowledge you drop, the attention you give to the bands who aren't platinum sellers, and for all the camaraderie and laughs. Man, is that awesome. That comes to us from Jason in Detroit Rock City right here in the good old USA. And man, that is freaking awesome. That's a great review. Can't argue with that. I appreciate all the kind words. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, such a great review, man. I love it. I might need tissues because it's so good. I love it. If you think you can top that, good luck. But we'd like to see you try. Leave us a review, a recommendation, Podchaser, Apple Podcasts, Facebook, whatever, wherever. We'll take them all. And if they're as good as that one, man, that's freaking awesome. Yeah, that's a great review. Keep them coming. And uh, our other favorite people, the Geeks of the Week, these are people that shared on Facebook and retweeted on Twitter. Last week's Quarantine Sessions 5 with special guest Victor Ruiz. Thanks to Victor for coming on. And be sure to check out Mars Attacks podcast if you haven't already. And also his Galaxy of Geeks podcast. We cover a lot of cool sci-fi and pop culture stuff. Yeah, Victor's an awesome dude. was a lot of fun to have on the show with us. And you know what? He helped you get your crown back. We'll see if you get to keep it today. I don't know. I got some stiff competition today. All right, Geeks of the Week this week are Mike Grabowski, Covers and Fire Podcast, James McElhenney, Kristen Schimbeck, Jay Shabluski, Bill Elam, Aaron Martell, Simon Cat, Shea Hargett, Victor Ruiz, Mars Attacks Podcast, Mark Alton Taylor, Freeform Rock Podcast, Joseph Capone, Adam Cox, Thor Bjorn Olson, Kevin Williams, Christopher Stokes, Nate Atchison, Craig Turdich, Scott Crouch, Aaron Baker, Mike Parnell, David Glenn, Sit and Spin with Joe, CGCM Podcast, Trevor McDougal, Jeff Taylor, Jay Ruiz, Ayala, JJ Max, Steve. The Steve actually shared the episode. Nice. Joel Hoffman, Jeffrey Mendenhall, Ernesto Aguiar, and as always, the, the Mooger, Mooger Fooger. Fooger. That's right. Those are our people, our good, good friends. They get out and tell the world what's going on here with the Decibel Geek Podcast by sharing and retweeting the episodes. If you want to become an honorary geek of the week, you know what to do. Just share or retweet this week's episode, our fun conversation we're about to have with our awesome friend, Baco. I hope. Are you there? Oh, I was I supposed to? <laughs> <laughs> Where we throw to you? 
Ah, well, you usually follow up like, how are you, Baco? I am fucking great, man. Glad hey. to be on the Decibel Geek podcast. My first <laughs> time, what the hell? It took fucking 400 episodes? Well, we're going to have you back for episode 800. Yeah. Oh, sweet. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll put it on the calendar. Well, Aaron and I are both uh, big fans of your show, even though you bust our balls on a regular basis. And um, <laughs> how are things at Cobras and Fireland? Uh, pretty good. Um, you know, we've been... Uh, Lewis has dialed back his commitment, so you know he doesn't have the, the same drive and, and passion for podcasting that the three of us do. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, you, I know you got him coming on, uh, uh, coming up here too, so he can bust bust me back a little bit there. Yeah, I, I, I would like to point out that I started kind of a side cast to fill in the the open weeks. Uh, whatever, never mind. It's it's, it's a grunge theme uh, podcast where I'm counting down Rolling Stones' totally credible list of the 25 greatest uh, grunge albums of all time. Um, and I, there's a few of them out there. We got I got more already in the can coming up. Uh, look for those. Um, that's been a lot of fun. But uh, the, the the bread and butter is of course the show with Luz. And uh, yeah, we got all sorts of fun stuff lined up. I got an interview. Uh, I guess by the time this comes out, you you can go back and check out my near interview with Ron Keel, his fourth time on the show. That'll be out. Um, I don't know. All sorts of good things coming up. We got a, a kiss episode coming. I know that always does well with the listeners. So I like all kinds of stuff. And uh, I'd like to point out that Aaron Camaro appears on Covers and Fire every single week these days. That's right. I'm the third host. Yeah, pretty regular. Yeah, he's he, kind of an Andy Richter role. <laughs> he's there to make sure that somebody laughs at our jokes because most people won't. But uh, we appreciate your, your commitment too, Aaron. Good. Even my commitment is bigger than Luce's commitment to your show. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> All right. Well, we, we put out the call for questions, and you guys delivered again, and uh, I guess we'll get started. Big time, man. I was always worried that, you know, the quarantine session, I hope I hope the questions don't run out of steam before the quarantine does. But, man, you guys have been knocking it out of the park. We've got a whole bunch of great ones here today, and we'll go ahead and get started with them right off the top. Um, this one comes to us from Rock Music Junkie 74 and he asks... While a lot of us have a lot of extra time on our hands, have you guys discovered any new bands or older bands that are new to you? So you guys been checking out anything during the lockdown? I don't know if it's necessarily because of the, the lockdown, but I've been listening to a band called White Reaper, which uh, I, I was recently turned on to. Uh, I'm really enjoying that. They're out of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so I'm just go- starting to, to get into basically their whole catalog. They have a few records out, but their their most recent one I've been uh, streaming a little bit. Uh, don't tell uh, our listeners that, I yes, I streamed a record. But uh, uh, I'll eventually probably picking that up and, and checking more of this stuff out. But beyond that, um, I mean, not not a lot of stuff that, that's brand new. I mean, I, I, I listen to some of the newer releases that have been out. But what about you guys? Man, I like that uh, White Reaper a lot. They're a great band. We've played them on the show before. Um, really? What's I think the album was called like America's Greatest Rock and Roll Band in the World or something like that. <laughs> yeah. I've got the CD. It's really good. I've um, the only two that really stay. I mean, I I I I'm scatterbrained, so I'll bounce from one thing to another. So the two that stick out right now, when I think about it, uh, there's a band called Stallion that I've recently gotten into, and they're they're kind of like a old school new wave of British heavy metal sounding band. Their singer is a bit of a acquired taste, but I really like what they they're doing. It's a little heavier than what I usually listen to. And then a uh, melodic rock band that the guys from growing up rock podcast turned us on to recently called heat that uh, are pretty good. I like them. Other than that though, a lot of YouTube deep dives into um, dark side of the ring and old major league baseball clips. <laughs> <laughs> kind of scatterbrained through this quarantine so i I just bounce around on between youtube and uh music sites and yeah those two those two bands stick out the most to me i I actually recorded a bunch of episodes of uh whatever never mind during the three weeks i was off so that between that and editing those things um yeah that was a large part of my free time right on and I'm still working on adding music to my new iPod, so I've been really doing some deep dives on my own CD collection. So I've been listening to uh, the NOLA album by Down, and mm. I haven't listened to that in forever, and it's freaking awesome, man. There really isn't a bad track on that album. Um, I've been listening to Faith No More's Angel Dust. 
because I haven't listened to that one in a while, and that's a freaking. I mean, Faith No More is always the same for me because they're they're they've got some really awesome rock tunes, and then they got some weird kind of yeah, like real artsy stuff. But the stuff that I really like. I love a lot, you know, and that Angel Dust has got some really awesome songs on it. Uh, another one I've been listening to, I kind of just did the deep dives on these albums because I wanted to add them to the iPod, you know, so I go through and pick out the songs I like the best, but I really make sure to give the whole album a good listen before I make that final cut. And one that I was listening to that I think people don't think about a lot because it came out in 2004, but it's the Inferno album by Motorhead. And, man, there's some really metal songs on there. There's some songs that sound like they could have came out on Ace of Spades. I mean, it's it's a really cool album. Like I said, when you think about the Motorhead discography, I don't think most people think of, like, the album that came out in 04. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. And then I pulled out Slaughter's Wildlife. And I, <laughs> man, I forget what a eclectic album that is because there's some good slaughter rock tunes on there, but there's also some weird kind of experimental songs on that album too. It's like the first half is what you'd expect as the follow up to their first album, and then like the second half has got some stuff mixed into it that is really kind of out there. And I should probably go back to that because when that initially came out, I rejected it on spec. I did not like that wildlife track. And so I kind of ignored it, even though my roommate bought it. Uh, but I, I don't know what recently in the, like the last decade, I heard wildlife again. It might've even been on your guys' show. Did you guys know that I'm thinking of a different, uh, wild America. Well, but, but wildlife I heard, um, and it's a, actually a really killer tune, man. So maybe I should go back and give that, that album a, a fair crack. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of mixed. I have mixed feelings on that record. I, it was a, it was a letdown for me when it came out, I was looking forward to it and it didn't really measure up to the first one, but I, I mean, it, I, it, and like Baco said, I probably need to go back and give it another chance. It's probably been 15 years since I've tried to listen to that record. I think yeah, you should. You just can- that was the reason I pulled it out was because I hadn't listened to it in forever. Yeah. And I remember when it came out, I remember being excited about it coming out. I remember digging the song wildlife when I saw the video and, uh, yeah, I like it. You know, there's a, I didn't take every song off it and put it on the iPod. Cause like I said, some of it's, you wouldn't even think it was a slaughter song, but there's some odd stuff on that album. And, uh, but for the most part, the songs that are good are really, really good. And then the last one I was checking out was twisted sister love is for suckers. Mm. And cause again, I hadn't listened to that in forever and it's not a great twisted sister album couple great tracks, so Wake Up a Sleeping Giant. I love that one. And um, I, don't, I like Love is for Suckers, too. Yeah, but I other than them, up, there's up. really not a whole lot on that. It's pretty cheesy, really. Yeah, that's why I like it. Yeah, <laughs> it's not I as, know that. It, 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 yeah, it's too cheesy compared to their other stuff. <laughs> right, exactly. I like the serious Twisted Sister. <laughs> like, stay hungry. Oh, man. All right, let's go to the next question. What bands that have been around 25 plus years and putting out new music are putting out as good or better music now versus their prime or most widely known period. That comes to us from Jason Kearney. I'd I'd have to say Striper is the first one that comes to mind for that. That's a good one. Yeah, definitely. I was having a conversation with somebody last week about Striper and I was like, did you know that Striper from the last 10 years has put out some of the best music they've ever put out? They're like, really? Striper's still putting out music? It's sad. <laughs> um, uh, I think one that pops in my head is Saxon. I think Saxon's putting yeah. out some of their best stuff ever. Overkill is still putting out some of their best stuff. Um, I know I've mentioned it every week, the last few weeks, that new Local H is freaking killer. Just awesome. Their last album was really good. I think they're putting out some of their best stuff ever. There's two that from last year that that I forgot to mention: Tigers of Pantang and Diamond Head. Yeah, you know I, I agree with your Overkill thing, but I'm not a big Overkill mind. Um, but it does seem like the general consensus is, is they're very consistent. And and even though he's not with us anymore, I'm talking about Lemmy. Um, I thought Motorhead their their last three records were among their better. Um, but as far as stuff that's still kind of going, you know, I, I I did an interview with. Uh, John Levin, who's in, in Dokken right now. And for that, I listened to the more recent Dokken records, which I never even gave a chance. And they were much better than I thought. 
Um, so I'm, I'm going to go back to those a little bit. I think Pearl Jam has been real consistent if you're a fan. Um, other than the last record, I think Ozzy's been pretty pretty good with the, the two before that. I know that's not exactly a popular opinion, but I actually enjoy those records. And, and even the new one, there's there's some stuff on there I can dig. And, and Iron Maiden... I think uh, has continued to you know be. I, I think in almost any case, the 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 peak has been hit by almost all, all these bands. But the fact that you can kind of still create you know music that 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 can still you know move people a little bit and connect, uh, I, I always find impressive. Um, I don't know the Rolling Stones. You know, I guess they don't really know new mu- new music in a while, but. I, I thought uh, a couple records ago, a bigger bang was decent, but th- those are some, those are what came to mind. I'm sure if I did more uh, deep dive on that, I'd come up with some other examples. But I agree with the ones you guys shared too. Striper was a good one, to be honest with you. It's kind of hard to put like the newer Ozzy albums up against the classic Ozzy albums, though. Well, that's kind of where I was going. You know, I mean, I wouldn't say these are better, but these are still really quality music. You know, I mean, good or better music, I think was the question. I guess as good. I get the. the <laughs> Maybe I am taking on a little the uh, loose definition on that. But, yeah, because uh, if that's uh, the case, I definitely got to disagree on the Iron Maiden too. <laughs> oh sure, yeah. Like again, these are not uh, the. I, I know Book of Souls isn't popular with a lot of people, but I, I think it's a very good record. Um, but they uh, and and I don't know. Whatever. Those are the ones I had. Oh, and <laughs> I'd be remiss if I didn't mention what was my album of the year last year: Flotsam and Jetsam. Uh, oh yeah, and if they if they ask me this question in four years, I can say Jesus Chrysler, but uh, we haven't been around twenty. We're not really around anymore anyway. But uh, I'll have I'll have new music by then. You'll have time. You can yeah. do it. All right, nice, good question. Um, here's one from Matt Ashcraft. He says, "I swear I asked this question, but I can't find it. What are your favorite rock based movies, not documentaries?" Oh. I hate to say the majority of the ones that are dr- dramatized are not good. So this is going to be a short list. Um, well, actually, the other night I did watch the uh, the Runaways movie, which I did not like when it first came out. I kind of liked it a little bit more this time. That's I the like one that, that comes out right off the top of my head. But that was That's better than I remember it being. You didn't like it? No. I thought I the know, actors in it were all to be, really good. To be honest, I don't understand the point. I mean... Did, did the 18 people who remember the Runaways really demand a movie? It's just, yeah. Well, they just weren't that big a band. It's not, you know. Well, I think because the Runaways were not a big band, you know, they did not, weren't successful like you would think of like other bands of that era. Um, yeah, Lita Ford is more successful than Cherry Curry or the Runaways, and she's ba- she's like a footnote in the movie. Right. Oh, that's. Yeah, I, didn't like I think that. that's that's the appeal of the Runaways, though, is because it's such an odd story. Because you got Joan Jett that goes on to kind of become a household name, you mm-hmm. know, Lita Ford goes on to become a household name in our circles, and you know, so then it it tells the story of like where they came from. But yeah, that movie did suck because Lita Ford was such a footnote in it. And that's what I didn't I, like. I thought I was watching an episode of To Catch a Predator when Kim Foley's character came in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. My, Michael Shannon was a little too on the nose with that yeah. character. Where yeah, some scenes. Yep, for sure. Um, I think some of mine we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Trick or Treat, still one of my all-time favorites. <laughs> That's a fun one. Um, I always liked Airheads. It was a good rock kind of movie. The story of the guys breaking in and trying to take over the radio station to get their album played and all the cool little cameos and stuff that are in their area. It's still one of my favorites. Um, I like Dazed and Confused. I mean, it's kind of a rock movie because of the soundtrack and the music they play is so awesome. And they're, they're going to see Aerosmith at the end of the movie. So that's always kind of a good one. Um, Rockstar. Oh. It's not bad. I mean, it's not great. As long as you don't try to take it in the context going, this is the Judas Priest story on its own. It's it's still pretty good. Um, I like School of Rock. <laughs> Detroit Rock City, of course. You gotta have that yeah, that's one all right. there. Um, what about Spinal Tap? Yeah, Spinal yeah. Tap for sure. I still like The Dirt, even though, like I said, it's not for hardcore Motley Crue fans. I still like the movie. I thought it was pretty cool. And, of course, my all-time favorite, Role Models. <laughs> Not really a rock movie, but I got uh, I'm going to give it to him. Yeah, give it to me. <laughs> there's there's way too many Kiss references in it to not be a rock movie. Yeah. Nobody's going nobody's gonna to bring up Bohemian Rhapsody? Uh, well, it, 
I haven't given my list, but that's definitely not on it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I haven't anybody seen who it. listens to our show that, that we talked about Bohemian Rhapsody and the dirt. I am just uh, biopics in general are just fucking shit. And even when, when one pops up and people go, this one's really good. It's the same shit. I watched that, uh, uh straight out of Compton movie and it was just as stupid and dumb as the one they do one about rock bands. Um, I actually think the dirt is better because it's so stupid. So I, I, I think the guy, um, uh, Machine Gun Kelly was way better as Tommy Lee than, um, the guy from Mr. Robot was as, as Freddie Mercury. Yeah. Uh, but as far as my pick, it's Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. Duh. Of course. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I had Blues Brothers and, and Singles. I think those are good movies. Um, but it, probably my favorite one is High Fidelity. That's a good one. That is a good movie. I haven't seen that in forever. I love a great documentary, though. Honestly, the Eagles documentary was killer. The Rush one was really good. Um, even ones that are just made well but aren't that deep, like the new ZZ Top one. I, I enjoyed that a lot. Uh, but so, but he specifically said not documentaries, but I, I do enjoy those quite a bit when, especially when they're, they're kind of done honestly, at least, you know, from the viewer's point of view. Yeah. Baco's That's got fun. good opinions, but he's not very good at following instructions. Mm, yeah. Well, I did say high fidelity so. <laughs> and then I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> All right. Matt Ashcraft also has a question that goes along with that. And he asks what our favorite rock and metal movie soundtracks are. Well, the one that comes to mind immediately is The Crow. I mean, I remember yeah. really, really I big. I remember really, really loving that soundtrack. I love the movie, too. But, uh, yeah, that soundtrack was one that didn't leave my car for quite a while. Right on. Uh, I got to go with Trick or Treat again. Yeah. Not fast only is way. the movie awesome, the whole it's it's basically a fast, fast way album. album. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Um, said Airheads, that had an awesome soundtrack to it. I like Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. Yeah, both uh, Bill and Ted movies actually yeah. had really good soundtracks. Yeah, the other first one was pretty good, too. Um, Bride of Chucky has got a really good soundtrack. I'm just kind of looking behind me at the soundtrack section on my CDs. <laughs> you have a soundtrack section. Nice. Strangeland. Yes, for sure. Mm-hmm. Last Action Hero. Mm-hmm. Better, way better than the movie, of course. That soundtrack was killer. I remember when that came out. Oh, I got ECW Extreme Music. I love that one. There's <laughs> a new record for bringing wrestling into the show. Uh huh. <laughs> well, I can't help it. I mean, that one's got that's got the uh, that's got Motorhead on there doing Enter Sandman. All right. Isn't that a Grammy Award winning yeah, track? Yeah, I won a Grammy. For- <laughs> uh, less than I'll, zero. Yeah. I like I the Beavis and Butthead soundtrack. I had Beavis and Butthead. Um, Judgment Night was a good one. Yeah. Uh, Lost Boys um, from back in the 80s there. And, and and I mentioned the movie singles. I thought that was a good soundtrack during the 90s. You know, there was a bunch of horror ones that had a lot of metal on them. Uh, I'm just drawing a blank. Bordello of Blood, I know it had an Anthrax song on it. Um, but but a lot of those um, had Scream a lot of like movies. kind of new metal kind of stuff going on that were pretty good. Oh, uh, you remember uh, Shocker? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a that good was one. a good soundtrack. Uh, I guess can't leave off heavy metal. That's a classic. Sure. <laughs> a lot of Hagar. Yeah, there's a. What's the. Um, I love the, the, the title, the, the, the song Heavy Metal by uh, Don Felder. Yeah, yeah Don that's Felder. what I'm thinking of. All right. That was a good question. I like that. Um, let's see. What is your top five underrated bands of all time and your top five overrated bands of all time? <laughs> that comes to us from Tommy Sanfilippo. Uh, we'd, we'd have to do an entire episode on this one. I think that's... Well, I, I, you know, I, I, I almost felt like this was like someone trolling me because was like uh, I, I don't think there are very many bands that are underrated or overrated, but uh, other than Beyonce is overrated. Uh, I, that was it. Uh, I guess I think Y and T is a bit underrated, just because I, I do think they had a chance to to crack if they would have had uh, I don't know certain things fall their way. The, the songs are there and the production and yeah. um, you know the look. You know even the name isn't isn't anything that held them back. So I thought about U two, but even then I'm like fuck. I kind of just because I don't like it doesn't mean they're overrated. But I don't know. I'll, I'll let you guys take this one from there. All right. Well, I looked at it as you know rock-ish bands at least that 
so many people seem to love that I just can't seem to stand. So for most overrated, that's I a got better question. Yeah, U two, Creed, REM, <laughs> Dave Matthews Band, and Coldplay. I guess yeah, that's okay. a good list. I don't mind. Uh, I don't hate U two. I just don't like them that much. Yeah, I'm, I'm close to the same on the overrated list with you. I mean, definitely Coldplay, um, Creed, Nickelback. Uh, I'll say over for me over. I think Slipknot is overrated. I have never fully clicked with that band. I don't. I don't think that they're bad, but I think that they're. I think they're more overrated because of their image. But I think they're not as big as you think. Don't get me wrong; they're big, but I, I think they're almost like that. That really loud, opinionated person. That's that's to me um that kind of dominates a conversation that they aren't really the majority but uh th- they're big enough but uh they are kind of niche yeah uh, another overrate i'd say marilyn manson is overrated i i don't think there's that much great material there when you really go back and just study the music i think Agreed. he was shocked for the time but I, I went and saw him when he was at his height, and it was an entertaining show. But I was just, but musically, I was like, ah, it just kind of sits there, doesn't it? There's not a whole lot of, I don't know, not a lot of memorable stuff from him, in my opinion. And then coming from the underrated side, Y and T, I think for sure. And I know Devin and Baco disagree with me on this, but I still think King's X is underrated. <laughs> um, Perfectly uh, rated. Whatever. Yeah, I think Devin's co- coattailing me on that one too. That was mine long before I, I met him. I think uh, I think Tora Tora is underrated because you know it. You Dirty Honey gets all this praise over the past year about they're these are the new saviors of rock, and I'm like they sound just like Tora Tora did in 1990. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know where were all you people then? I think oh, and on the Wait overrated side, honey. on the out of overrated side, I'd say Greta Van Fleet for sure. Yeah. Uh, a serious question, though. You think King, King's X had a broad appeal? Oh, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> um, I think some of their songs I, definitely I, I, they're did. They're a great band, and, and I have a couple of their records, and, and there's songs I like. That was never my point. I just, they clearly, they're, they're for a very specific kind of audience. You know what I mean? I Well, maybe not in general, because of, I mean, they did a lot of experimentation over the years. But when certain singles, like It's Love or Dog Man, or Black Flag, or Summerland, or um, over, even Over My Head, which was, I guess, the biggest song they had, still didn't get to the level of success that I thought it deserved. I thought those songs deserved to chart better and get more attention. Yeah, you know, I the never... fact that I know all five of those songs kind of adds some validity to your argument, but they didn't sell a lot of records, and yet they never got, they had a, a pretty long run of major label re- record releases. To me, if anything, they were given more of a rope than maybe they 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 earned not deserved but uh well, anyway. we'll, have to, we'll have to agree to disagree on that one okay i think they're kind of underrated but my underrated list i always go back to pariah even though they only had the one album i think that album should be revered nowadays that's a great record isn't it it is a great record i wish they would have come out with more but and then then i think you know this band is dead and gone why don't people like revere this album? I guess because nobody's ever heard of it because they're so underrated. Uh, rest of my list would go uh, Super Suckers, Enough's Enough, Ugly Kid Joe, and of course, Tough. I'm so shocked. <laughs> <laughs> what about Local H? Uh, no, they're pretty well rated, I think. People, Perfectly rated, people yeah. know them and like them. But yeah, I guess you'd have to put them right up there, too. All right, here's a bunch of quick ones from Andrew Jacobs. These are cool. I like this. Uh, Van Halen 1 or Fair Warning? Van Halen 1. Yeah, Van Halen. Oh, man, I like a lot of the stuff off Fair Warning, but side by side, mm, I got to go with Van Halen 1 also. Uh, Question number two, Rock and Roll Over or Creatures of the Night? Mm. Closer on this one, but Rock and Roll Over. Today, I would say rock and roll over, but that can change next week. Right. I guess it just depends on what you're in the mood, and there's so much great stuff on both those, it's hard to pick. But, yeah, I'm also going to go with rock and roll over. So far, we're all in agreement on everything. Uh, number three, volume four or Sabotage? Well, Sabotage is my favorite Sabbath record, so that that one. I'd go Sabotage. Yeah, Sabotage is damn awesome, but for sentimental reasons, I think I'm going to break it and go with Volume 4. 
Nothing wrong with that. Because that was one I, my dad had around when I was a little kid. That was really that and Paranoid were my first Sabbath albums because I listened to his so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, Italian food or Mexican food? Italian mm-hmm. tonight, Mexican tomorrow. I'd pick Italian any day. Yeah, I love them both. I guess I'll go with Italian. The Godfather trilogy or the 77 to 83 Star Wars trilogy? Star Wars. Never clicked with Godfather. I like both, but I'll say Star Wars. Uh, Yeah, I was brought up on Star Wars. Just kind of recently started watching the Godfather trilogy. I really need to finish that up. Uh, But yeah, definitely Star Wars. You only need the first two Godfather movies. Yeah. Yeah. Three's okay, I guess. Which is worse or better? Bang Bang (laughs) You or Read My Body? Oh, boy. (laughs) Jeez. Uh, Uh, I think I'm going to go with Bang Bang You just by an edge. Small one. Me too. Uh, That's a good one, though. Yeah. Fuck. It's like, which would you rather have? Syphilis or, you know. um, I guess I'd say Bang Bang You, but they both suck. Yeah, (laughs) not the best examples of Kiss, for sure. Which is the cheesier Bon Jovi lyric? I walk these streets, a loaded six string on my back, or my life is like an open highway, but Frankie said I did it my way. Can, can something be cheesy, but you still like it? Yeah, sure. I don't think okay. I walk these streets, a loaded six string on my back is really that cheesy. It's kind of clever That's and cool. That's pretty cheesy. I like I it. I like it better. I'm okay anyway. with both of them. If I'm picking one, probably the Frankie said I did it my way. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. <laughs> Pretty cheesy, Frankie. <laughs> you fucking Jersey guys all sticking together. <laughs> uh, Mick Watkins wants to know, have you heard my band Wild Ride? <laughs> and if so, what do you think? Have you guys checked go, out Wild can Ride? I go first? Yeah. I had never heard these guys, but because of this question, I, went, I tried to check them out. Um, and, uh, I guess, you know, maybe I should have gone back when we we're having all those, uh, problems getting set up here. Uh, I, so I didn't get a good read on it. My, my only comment is that the singer sort of looks like a Ryan cook. Hmm. Chris, did you check it out? I, no, I'm not going to lie. I have not had time. Well, I've not taken the time to check it out, but Mick, uh, you always ask great questions and I certainly need to check it out. Cause I have heard that you guys are good. I actually went ahead and checked it out. I checked out a couple of songs. I really like the song Pushin'. So it's Wild Ride. It's spelled W-Y-L-D-R-Y-D-E. It's very classic metal, 80s metal style. And, uh, yeah, that song Pushin' is freaking badass. And the album's called City Streets, and you can like them on Facebook. And I recommend everybody check them out because I want to check out more of it for sure. But I really dig that song. You said the, the song was called Pushing? Yeah. All right, I'll check that out. Really good. I dug it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Grayson Galagos wants to know, what's a question you'd like to answer, <laughs> but no one asks? Go ahead, Baco. I, you know, honestly, I, I tried to think of one, but um, I, 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 not, no legitimate one. I mean, I have a bullshit one. I, I think I responded to him saying, uh, how do you stay so humble? <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, but it, nobody uh, asks. <laughs> maybe maybe we should. <laughs> I should get my wife down here to see if she wants to answer that one. But no, I honestly I, I can't think of anything specifically. Um, you know, I I do since I've I've started podcasting. I'm more on the other end where I'm I'm trying to come up with questions to ask. Uh, but uh, for the most part, uh, I, I'm willing to share almost any detail of my life. So uh, if, if there's anything you want to know, Grayson, let me know. But uh, I, I'm sorry I couldn't come up with a better answer. <laughs> it's a fun question, though. Yeah. Uh, I think the only one I can think of is what's your favorite number? Nobody's ever asked me that. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Now I want that question. Yeah. <laughs> the, the answer is 42, of course. <laughs> And if you didn't read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you'll have no idea what I'm referring oh, to. Okay. Oh, my wife's going to love that answer once I force her to listen to this show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's a big. She's the only reason I know the answer that what you were getting at there. But. Nice. You hey, got a favorite out. number, Aaron? My mom has sent in a question. Oh. <laughs> so this one comes oh, from Mama Camaro. 
is the <laughs> Elder so album worth $5,000 yet? Is there a backstory to this question? There is a backstory to this. Okay. When I was a kid, I thought the Elder was so rare that someday it was going to be worth big money. And I had a copy of The Elder. I actually ended up getting two copies of The Elder on LP. Now, I'm I'm not... This isn't in 1981 when it comes out. This is years later. Sure. So I had the one with the paper inner sleeve with the lyrics on it, and then I had the one with the clear inner sleeve that you could see through. And when I got the second one, I said, okay, cool. Well, I'm going to give this other one to my friend Jason who is a huge Kiss fan and doesn't have the Elder. So I'm going to give this to him for his birthday. So my mom had listened to my bullshit for all these years about me talking about how this album is so rare and how it's going to be worth a lot of money someday. I'm going to hang on to it. And, hey, this might even put me through college. and all. I don't, <laughs> I don't know where I got the idea. Uh, community college in Wisconsin, I think you got to Yeah, I maybe that. could have for a semester possibly. <laughs> but... uh just because it was so hard to find, you know, it's not like you could go to the local new music store and find it on cassette tape or find it on LP at that time, you know, so I really thought it was rare. And so my mom had listened to me talk all this for so long that she believed that it was something special. Like I actually knew what I was talking about. And so when she found out that I had given it to him as a gift, she actually made me take it back. Oh, so she was mad at me over this. And, it, you know, we laugh about it now because it was my own fault because I was running about my mouth about how this album is so rare and so special, not knowing what the hell I was talking about. But I had to call my friend up and make him like, look, man, you know, I wanted to give that to you as a birthday gift. But my mom found out and she's making me take it back. You know, I don't know what to do. And he's like. Hey, you can't do that. You know, you gave it to me as a birthday present. I was like, yeah, I know, but my mom is making me get it back. <laughs> so I ended up getting it back from him and hanging on to it. But, you know, like I said, I didn't know if it was going to be worth $5,000. And I bought the remastered CD at the McKay's for 7 bucks. <laughs> $7 too much. <laughs> oh, uh, Mama Camaro, uh, it may not be worth $5,000, but there is some collectability to that record. And in the mid-80s especially, it seemed like you weren't even... Part of you didn't believe the album actually existed the way it was. You couldn't see it. You find it anywhere. Right. Um, yeah, I, I have, I don't know, probably seven copies of it on vinyl. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, the the two two versions of the CD. I bought that on CD import. It cost me like 50 bucks from Japan because they hadn't pressed it here yet. Yeah. And I swear to God, it, might, it probably wasn't this quick, but it seemed like a week later is when the first editions of all the Kiss CDs started coming out, or when that came out anyway. That was actually after the first run, but anyway. So... You you had a certain point that there was going to be some collectability to that record compared to the other ones, but yeah, probably not five grand. What makes you have to have seven different copies of the album? Are there seven seven different versions of it? Oh, I'm sure there's some childhood trauma. You know, uh, <laughs> my uh, my parents divorce. I basically I I no longer owned anything, and it was right around that time. Um, so I didn't get this record when it came out because of that. We were we were poor enough when 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 they were married. It was even worse when they were split. And then when I lost all my Kiss shit, as I started rebuilding my own collection, this one was always kind of special to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, look, it, it's, it's condition and price will get me to buy any copy I see, basically. So if, if it's not terribly outrageously priced and it's in good shape, I'll, I'll usually pick up a copy. But I have like a foreign, like a Chilean version of it. Uh, I have the two you mentioned, probably a couple copies of each. Uh, I have the remastered one from the 2014 repressings, but I don't know. See, Mom, I'm not the only crazy one. Yeah. Hey, at least your mom knows what the Elder is. Exactly. <laughs> but why? You want to hear another quick, funny Elder story? Yeah, why not? Okay, so my wife, she hears us talking about Kiss and stuff all the time. And we were watching that show on Reels about Kiss and the Elder come up. And I said, oh, yeah, the Elder. And she says, well, what is the big deal about that album? I hear, you know, I, in, in the background, I hear 
you guys talking about it all the time, you know, about what a weird album it is. What's the deal with that? So the other night I sat down and I had it in the CD player. And I said, okay, I'm going to tell you the story about the, about the Elder, music from the Elder. I said, so in 1981, when this album comes out, there's a bunch of young Kiss fans that are really excited about the new album. Like in the magazines, they were talking about, like, this is going to be a return to form for Kiss, you know, and back to our roots and playing some hard rock and stuff, you know. So people were excited about it, people that were big Kiss fans. And so they went to the store, and I said, when they got to the record store and they went to the K section and dug in, this is what they found, and I showed her the album cover. And she kind of crinkled her nose, and it's like, that's a Kiss record? You know, this is for my wife. She's not nerds like us about it. And, but it's clear to her that, you know, what a kid would think expecting a new Kiss record. And so I said, okay, furthermore than that, these kids look at this album and they go, huh, okay, well, I mean, it's a big, you know, metal-looking door. Maybe, you know, maybe it is heavy and cool. And they rush and they bring it home. And I put the CD in and I said, and they, you know, couldn't wait. And they put the needle down to the record and let it rip and, Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and again her nose crinkles up and i said oh wait wait you know the first song hasn't even kicked in yet <laughs> <laughs> but instantly upon hearing the first couple of notes of just a boy she understood what the deal was with the elder oh boy i'll, I'll, I'll hold my comments to, to myself <laughs> <laughs> go out and listen to the two-part episode of cobras and fire for more information on kiss meets the elder i'll send her that link for sure <laughs> all right here's a cool question from aaron baker another kiss related one i'm not sure if this one's been asked but do you guys think with this whole quarantine thing paul might actually sound decent next time they're able to be on the road <laughs> that's from aaron baker do you think uh Paul's taking advantage of this much needed rest. I think if rest was the issue, it would have been corrected a while ago. Yeah, I I don't think there's much hope for Paul's voice at this point. Can't hurt. Yeah, that's true. Well, I mean, it, unless he keeps doing those videos. I, I oh, heard yeah, the right. uh, the tape machine is getting a nice rest. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope he just uses old school tape still. <laughs> it's what I know. Like reel to reel, he's got a reel to reel hidden hidden behind the cabinets. <laughs> like a fucking Walkman, he just hits a button. <laughs> Gary Corbett back there hitting buttons. Oh yeah, bring him back yeah. for that. Yeah, accidentally yeah. put on the forever reel. Ah, <laughs> uh, let's see. Here's one from Carlos Henriquez. He wants to know favorite Canadian metal groups. Have you heard of the awesome Canadian band Slick Toxic, or the band Slash Puppet? Uh, I've heard of both of them. I love Slick Toxic. That's one awesome band that nobody ever really seems to talk about. Uh, I saw them, uh, oh, God, on some five-band bill here a few years back, but I don't know much about them. But... Were they good? Yeah, the show was nice, yeah. Played well. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I kind of like some of the Helix's stuff. I mean, th they're definitely perfectly rated, as you guys would say, but I mean... <laughs> There's if you took their songs. big songs and put them on one record, it'd be a fucking monster album. Yeah. Um, there's hmm. also there's a band I played years ago on the show called The Tea Party, which that name would definitely not go over as well today. Um, but uh, they were they're actually pretty good. They kind of sound like a modern version of The Doors. I kind of like them. Um, I don't know. CGCM podcast can tune you into all the good Canadian <laughs> bands. I love Monster Truck. I want to mention them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and of course, not going to surprise anybody, the Glorious Sons. But and you mentioned oh, yeah. so the ones I had. Oh, not really a band, but Sass Jordan's pretty great. I'm going to go classic old school and say Bachman Turner Overdrive. Oh, nice. Well, what about we should mention Rush, of course. Well, yeah, Rush um, from Canada. That's, uh, <laughs> the rumor has it, Killer Dwarfs. Oh yeah, you got to love the Killer Dwarfs. <laughs> Overrated. <laughs> no. <laughs> Depends on which side of the border you're standing on. Oh, I knew that would get you uh, back. Baco, have you ever heard the Method to the Madness album that they did? Uh, I don't think so. What year would that have been around? Uh, I couldn't tell you what. It's some late 80s, I think, or early yeah, 90s. Well, well. So, like, before um, Deadly Weapons? After. Okay. All right. Uh, no, nope. believe it was after it was Jerry Finn's first record with them. But um, give that one a listen. I think you might dig it. Okay. Method to the Madness. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, what, what the hell? Why not? Awesome. I actually, I'm not a hater in that band. I was just kind of poking at you guys anyway. <laughs> I've never heard of Slash Puppet. Me either. Rich did an article on them on decibelgeek.com a few years back, and I, I liked what I heard at the time. Right Is on. Carlos Henriquez a uh, anagram for Rich? Uh, I can't remember Richard Dillon. <laughs> I don't think so. Maybe, yeah. but since this came up, it reminds me, and I forgot to add it to the list, Wally sent me a message, and he wanted to know who our favorite Canadian rock bands were. And he also wanted to know, out of the two hosts on the CGCM podcast, Rich and Wally, which one each of us found more attractive? <laughs> <laughs> the gopher. <laughs> oh, man. I get um, equally aroused looking at both of them. Yeah. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty attracted to the to their gopher mascot thing that they have. No, yeah, no doubt. Or is it a beaver? Maybe it's a all, beaver. All teeth. <laughs> Rich is kind of rugged, and Wally's such a cutie pie, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that baby head. Yeah, you just want to squeeze it. <laughs> Come here, Wally. Let me squeeze your baby head. Wait, that <laughs> don't sound right either. <laughs> It's taking a very weird turn. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos got another cool question here. I know this one must be aimed at Baco. He wants to know best to worst tough albums. They had more than one? Well, technically, <laughs> if you're looking at studio albums, technically they had four. Okay. So, I have only heard the uh, their whatever 91 release with... Um, all new generation on right there. I, that comes around, goes around. <laughs> yeah, that record's all right. Whatever. I haven't, I haven't heard any of the other stuff. He's <laughs> he's too big of a cheesehead. Uh, that uh, the singer there. That's so. why you should love him even more. Mm. I, I only got room for one cheesehead in my life, buddy, and that's you. Oh. All right. Well, I guess let's go to the expert on the subject here amongst us, and that would be me. So, Carlos. There's the answer to your question. Number one would be Fist First slash Religious Fix because the EP that came out first, all them songs are pretty much on Religious Fix, so I count it as one one of my favorite all-time albums of all time, all bands, all genres, all time. Religious Fix, freaking awesome. That's number one. Number two, the debut, What Comes Around Goes Around. Number three... I included American Hair Band because it's a full album, a lot of demo songs and a lot of redone songs from Stevie's collection, but still some great stuff on there. And then finally, the last one, the newest one, which it's kind of old now, is What Comes Around Goes Around Again in fourth place. But yeah, Religious Fix by Tough. When anybody hears me on the show talking about how much I love that band, especially that album is the reason why. And speaking of which, we got to talk to Steve Rochelle about getting him back on the show to pick up where we left off because that was the whole purpose of doing that was to get to that album. Yeah, <laughs> I still want to have him back to do that one. He's always good at telling stories. Yeah, Stevie's awesome. For sure. I think he's done so much other stuff. You know, he's got solo albums. He's got albums with other bands. He does that shameless stuff. You know, it's, it's all good. I like it all. Uh, here's an awesome question from Todd Zilla. Y'all got any Jackson guitars in there? <laughs> not at my house. I just have a BC Rich. Yeah, that's what I got here too. Uh, not none of none of mine are Jacksons. I was never uh, a big Jackson fan. Um, most of their guitars, when I was actually you know trying out different stuff, like you know talking late eighties, early nineties, they all had the the Floyd's on them and. I checked out of need. I have one guitar with a tremolo and a, with a Floyd on it. It's a it's a BC Rich, but I only I rarely play it largely because I think those things are such a pain in the ass. Um, so maybe I should try one of their because they've kind of uh, their newer stuff. It seems like they've shifted into kind of a set bridge thing, and maybe I should maybe I'll like it. I don't know. Give it a try. You never know. Why not? I always need I, another guitar. I so, agree on the Floyd Rose. Yeah. I guess that. Covers the follow-up yeah, question. Hold on, I'm going to retune. I have to tune my guitar. I'll be back in 83 minutes. <laughs> 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 uh, it's nothing worse than like, I know that not everybody knows what we're talking about, but I'm assuming Chris does. He's like when you you get everything ready and you you set those locks 
and then you yep. run out of space on your fine tuner. It's like motherfucker, I'm so close. Yep. Oh, so yeah, I just and you know, look, I'm a rhythm player, so I don't fucking need the damn thing. But all right, that went deeper than I think it was supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> they all do. <laughs> nice. Thanks, Todd Zilla. If you don't get that one, go back in the archives. Todd Zilla's got the best stories. That one's about Ace Fraley. Uh, here's a couple here that uh, come. One of them comes from Christopher Stokes, and one of them comes from Joe Polo, but they're both about the same question. What is each of your all time favorite songs, artists that wouldn't necessarily fit into your tastes, and why? And what's your music guilty pleasure? Hmm. Band or singer nobody knows you love. Who do you love, Baco? What's your deepest, darkest secret? You know, the best I can... I mean, I, I'm pretty open, so there there isn't a whole lot that I would call a secret, but I, I would I would venture to guess not too many people are aware that um, I really enjoy that first Snoop Dogg record, Doggy Style. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I probably play that at least once a year still. Yeah. Uh, just the whole record... From beginning to end, as far as favorite track, I'm actually pulling it up here. Um, well, I, I love the the What's My Name. The the first single on there is is a great one. But ain't no fun if the homies can't have none as good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> cheese up, hose down. Um, and then the yeah the 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 funk intro. Gin and Juice never really did it for me. That probably <laughs> the one week track. But uh, no joke. Uh, that album, uh, wow. forever. I mean, I had a bit of a gangster rap phase, but most of it kind of went by the wayside. But that one has hung around, and I still enjoy it quite a bit. Never oh. in all the years of doing this show did I ever think I'd hear a breakdown of the Snoop Dogg album on the <laughs> Decibel Geek podcast. <laughs> you know, a funny story is that uh, when I bought that, I was uh, I had just moved back home prior to moving to the Twin Cities, so I just fin- finished college. By finished, I mean I was no longer going to college. Um, <laughs> and so I, I was living with my dad. I lived with my dad for about a year now. When this record came out, and uh, and he heard me playing, he kind of comes into my room, and and he's a you know you might you know he's, he's a small town you know Minnesotan white man. You know what I mean? He's like, what? I didn't think you liked this kind of music. And because <laughs> I'm a dick, I'm like, what kind of music is that, Dad? And uh, he, he struggled to like come up with a non-racist way to, to say it. Wow. But he's like dark people music. I don't know. Uh, Missy pops. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Wow. Anyway, Aaron, that's it. What do you guys got? Um, I don't know. I ain't got nothing too far out the box. I don't really listen to rap. I mean, I guess if I was going to listen to rap, it would be like from around that same time in that era just because I remember when it was new, and I've never heard it any better. Um, I would say, I don't know, I like Blondie. I like Jerry Rafferty. I like the Go-Go's. How many Jerry Rafferty songs can you name? I can only name one. I can only my name a Bob couple. Dylan song. But, I mean, I'm not huge into it, but it's kind of like, you know, like some of that AM gold that I hear that it's okay. like it reminds me of being a kid and doing stuff when the radio was on. You know, and I I just remember I had my dad had that record. I mean, kind of like uh, Black Oak, Arkansas. You know, I, that's that's kind of far on the edge of what I listen to because it's almost country music. You know, and I'm not a big country music guy, but I love that. And uh, reggae, I like reggae with electric guitar. I can listen to some Bob Marley. I'm a big fan of Sublime, some of their stuff. Um, what else? Oh, Duran Duran, of course. That's kind of my oddball stuff. Um, I guess for me, uh, well, I went, to, you know, growing up in Nashville in the early '90s, I I really did get into country for a little while, I, I, and I to this day I still like some of Garth Brooks' stuff. I still think some of those songs are really well-written songs. Even went and saw him with my wife live about a year ago. Um, also, kind of the AM Gold yacht rock type stuff from the '70s. I can I can dig sometimes. Uh, when I lived in Kansas city, I got into some jazz music. I got into miles Davis, Charlie Parker, uh, Wes Montgomery, good jazz guitar player, have some of his stuff on vinyl, stuff like that. Um, some singer songwriter stuff. I like, I'll listen to some of that stuff, but, uh, I don't know. I'm kind of all over the board. I mean, I, I'll change it up pretty regularly. I'm sorry. That's incorrect. The answer they were looking for was juice Newton. (laughs) Well, he said p- stuff that people wouldn't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're, you're a legendary Juice Newton fan. Sorry. 
<laughs> I knew I knew somebody was going to bring that shit up. Yeah, nice. <laughs> All right, our main man, the Mooger Fooger, he wants to know, we have lost Randy Rhodes, Dime, Michael Jackson, Prince, and so many other legends. Who is the next that we can't afford to lose? It's got to be Ozzy. Yeah, that would be, that's probably the, the number one on my list. It's been so scary lately that, you know, there's been so many reports over the last couple of years that, oh, Ozzy's about to die, you know, that it kind of freaks you out every time. Yeah, I have to put Ozzy right up there, but I don't want to lose any more legends. I don't know. That's a tough one. Yeah. Uh, Steve Wright, he's wondering, who is the most underrated hard rock band of the 70s? A lot of great bands from the 70s that made it big, but twice as many that didn't. Who's the best one that didn't make it big? Thin Lizzy. They made it big, but, you know, in the States, they're just not kind of... Uh... I don't know. As much as I'm not a big underrated guy, that's one band that probably deserves a lot more recognition in the, in this country than they get. Yeah. yeah, you stole my answer. Yeah, hard to well, disagree with that. Well, I figured you'd have a, a more detail, so I just jumped in there. You're you're a much bigger fan. No more about them. Well, I mean, I, yeah, there's so many amazing songs, especially on the '70s records. There's there's a ton of and stuff that's radio friendly. Between them and the Ramones, I think both bands should have had way way many more hits. Yeah, hard to disagree with those. Those are both really great picks. I was going to say, maybe not underrated at the time, but I think in retrospect, they don't get a lot of love, and that's Grand Funk Railroad. You know, that's a good one, too. Yeah. Blue Oyster Cult. Yeah, I love me some Blue Oyster Cult, too. Uh, Jody Havnot's wondering, what is the best sophomore effort of all time? They call it the sophomore slump, but every once in a while, some band knocks it out of the park with their second album. I think the first one that comes to my mind is always Slave to the Grind. That's a good one. Yeah, it's either that, and but it wasn't a success, but Dog Eat Dog by Warrant. That was their third album. Was it really? Yeah. Oh, no. Dirty, yeah, Rotten, Filthy, Stinkin' Rich, oh. then Cherry Pie, then oh. Dog Eat Dog. I wanted to forget about Cherry Pie subconsciously. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But yeah, I guess I would go with Slave to the Grind. It's kind of hard to argue with that one. What about Motley Crue is Shout at the Devil? Yeah, that's yeah. a pretty good second album. Hard to argue with that one. And if you're going full-length studio albums, I, I would say Dirt by Alice in Chains is a great second record. Yeah. Even yeah. Tesla had a really good second album. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a good one, too. I guess that's one I have to think on more, but I'm sure there's probably a bunch that are obvious. But yeah, those are all great ones right there. Yep. Mark Leedy wants to know how would you explain Kiss to an alien <laughs> species in one Kiss song? Just a boy. <laughs> uh, I finally found my way to you. Uh huh. Yeah, nice. I think you guys oh, are trying it. to, you're scared they're going to take Kiss away. Yeah. You're like, oh, I, you, play, the, you play them something great, they're going to be like, awesome, we're taking this with us. In seriousness, I'd probably say Black Diamond. Yeah, that's a good pick. Um, yeah. Nothing to lose, it would be fun. Song about butt sex, plus it kicks ass. <laughs> 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 the alien yep. probes, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> They're familiar with the probes. You totally relate yeah. to this. <laughs> I think that's the perfect answer. What if answer. it's funny? Like it's an inside joke that uh, aliens. It's like that's not my alien penis. That's just a probe. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs> all right, Jason Dreesen wants to know: Is Bigfoot real? <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'm guessing you guys don't know this. Uh, Jason is one of my oldest friends. We go back to uh, junior high, um, and we still stay in contact quite a bit. He is uh, he, he's an interesting dude, man. Um, I, I There's no inside joke here, though. Uh, but nah, no, Bigfoot is not real. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So there's no inside joke to that. You know this There is guy. not. No, <laughs> I kind of wish he would have kind of dug a little deeper, but, you know, he, he posted it earlier this morning, and I saw that. I'm like, what? <laughs> but no, there's nothing there, sadly. But that, That's what makes that right awesome. <laughs> so you grew up well, in Minnesota. Been... you never seen a Bigfoot, huh? 
Um, no, not well. Not the one he's referencing anyway. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say, yeah, yeah. Well, I was at a monster a truck time. show one time. <laughs> he's very real. All right. So much for the Wisconsin education system. Well, I mean, we used to. Uh, what? You, what? Uh. When I was younger, I used to go around and ask people if they ever seen Bigfoot. Because I figure if somebody was going to see him, it would be in the north woods of Wisconsin, but nobody has ever right. seen him. You guys got ain't got dog men or nothing like that in Minnesota? <laughs> we got chubacabras. Because of the warm climate there, I suppose. Oh, yeah. Yes. It's very nice. <laughs> now, we got dog men, the dog men of Wisconsin. What is that? It's like a, like a hairy man with a dog head that live out in the woods. I think all these things... <laughs> No, I think we even don't Bigfoot. have stuff like that here. What the hell? Where'd you grow up? <laughs> we also got Paul Bunyan. Uh, uh, but I think, honestly, good. I think all that shit was real at one time. I think Bigfoot probably was real at one time and then became extinct. Just like, you know, just like Dogmen and Mothmen and all the weird shit, unicorns, whatever. All that stuff was probably real at one time. Chuds. <laughs> there's no they're still in detroit yeah. <laughs> they play for the uh lions nice maybe better if they did yeah uh let's see the other brother sinzak eric wants to Ooh. know what's your favorite kiss album cover uh rock and roll over yeah i guess if i was gonna get a kiss album cover tattooed on me it'd probably be rock and roll over that's a good way to put it. Um, yeah, I, would, I actually did an article on this um, for Snark at the Moon. I might have copied it in the uh, Decibel Geek. I don't recall. Uh, and I went and looked at it just to make sure I didn't uh, contradict myself. But uh, my favorite personal cover has been pretty much uh, for a long time the, the first album. I, I just love the uh, the imagery there for whatever reason. It just it, it resonates with me. But I do think their best cover is Rock and Roll Over. Second would be The Elder. <laughs> if I was going to get a tattoo of any album, it would be Asylum. The elder. A big old back Asylum tattoo. Ooh, nice. That's a commitment <laughs> there, man. <laughs> I'd get lick it up just so I could have Vinny's face on my back. Oh, who? <laughs> All right. You, you, oh, you, you were really close to get me there. Here comes a question <laughs> from a uh, longtime listener, Jason Bakken. Wants us to choose between Testless Hang Tough or Jane's Addiction's Mountain Song. Oh, I like them both. Yeah, see, when I was young, I didn't I didn't want to get into Jane's Addiction. I wanted to still like Motley Crue and Poison and shit, so I was kind of resistant to the Jane's Addiction until I heard the Mountain Song. And I was like, okay, this stuff is not all weird. There's actually some really good music here. A Mountain Song is freaking killer. If you don't think you like Jane's Addiction, go listen to Mountain Song. It's amazing. Is it as amazing as Tesla's Hang Tough? Nah, I don't think so. Not by a hair, but I got to give it to Tesla. Both riffs are pretty similar. Yeah, that bass intro is where I was going. But, or I'm sorry, where that asshole was going. Uh, but yeah, Hang Tough for me is a better tune, but I like them both too. Is that the reason you ask? Is because they're similar? Yeah, well, they uh, Jane's Addiction came up predates Hang Tough, right? <laughs> Um, if I recall right, but yeah, it's that yeah, it's very uh, I don't know, derivative. Let's put it that way. Hmm. You don't really put those two <laughs> bands together in most conversations. No, not really. <laughs> All right, Paul Korn wants to know: outside of musical items, do you collect anything? And after high school, what were your original career path goals? Baco, you collect anything? You know, um, for a while I collected like football cards, but honestly, I mean, I, I buy vinyl now, but he said non-musical stuff. There really isn't anything left uh, that I would say I collect other than, I don't know, empty beer cans. Um, <laughs> but I get rid of them pretty quick, too. Um, Do you still got any of your football cards? Did you get rid of them or you keep some? You know, I gave them all to my stepson. Yeah, cool. Mm-hmm. All my, I, I, had, I had a lot of basketball at, and uh, some hockey cards too, but it was mainly football. But yeah, when you were heavy into collecting, what was the most valuable card you ever had? Oh fuck, nothing really high end. Um, maybe about ten bucks. I think I had an Andre Risen rookie card. Nice. Um, but again, nothing. Um, 
Oh, nothing that was worth a lot, no. There might be a chase card that if he locks out might be worth something someday, but bad. For the most part, uh, it was about a two-year thing, and then I kind of bailed. Chris, what do you collect besides rock stuff? Uh, I mean, still mostly just rock stuff, but, uh, I mean, I used to really be heavily into baseball cards and baseball memorabilia. I still have a, a good chunk of stuff left. Uh, had to sell some of it when I was living on my own in Kansas City to keep a roof over my head, but still have a good amount of stuff. Mostly... You know, baseball stuff from like the 50s and 60s. My dad and I, that was kind of something we would do together. Nice. And uh, yeah, and I still have some of that stuff. I guess my most valuable thing I still have, I have an autographed Hank Aaron 1962 Topps baseball card. Wow. And I know at one point it was worth like $1,000, but I, I think it's the market dropped off a lot in the 90s. So it, it's probably not worth near that now. Do they still make sports trading cards? Oh, yeah. yeah. They're, yeah, yeah. they're good. They're actually getting quite popular again now. Finally, um, there's, and I'll still do. This, I, I'm still interested in the hobby. I just don't buy stuff anymore. But there's there's a whole trend of YouTube guys that they'll do like you know they'll call them like break videos where they'll they'll open like a classic baseball card pack and you can go, watch them go through it and find the stuff in it. And yeah, I I'm, I subscribe to like several channels that do that and kind of helps pass the time, brings back some memories. Mm, cool. That's cool. I think I got a Raleigh Fingers baseball card laying around here somewhere that came in a uh, loaf of bread, in Wonder Bread, I think. <laughs> I remember those cards. Yeah. <laughs> Used to get them in cereal boxes, too. Um, uh, Outside of CDs, and I don't, this ain't really nothing I pursue anymore, and I'm not online looking for things or anything like that, but I got a pretty good collection of Hulk Hogan stuff. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> I mean, it all started like back in 96 when Hogan turned evil on TV. And I was like, man, that's the coolest thing. And uh, it really it started with a Hollywood Hulk Hogan lighter. Because when I was a kid, I was a little pothead. So I'd always be hanging out with people, passing a bowl around. And when it was all said and done, I could always say, hey, where's my Hulk Hogan lighter? And somebody would have to cough it up because I was the only one that had one. And then from there, somebody gave me an action figure, and then somebody else gave me something else. And, you know, because I was, I liked Hulk Hogan. And pretty soon, I had all kinds of Hulk Hogan shit. I got some weird Hulk Hogan stuff. I got a Hulk Hogan kite. I got a little foam thing that you hook your boat keys to. And if you, you drop them in the lake, Hulk Hogan will swim them back to you. <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah, I got a whole big bin full of weird Hulk Hogan stuff. You know what my prize is in my collection? Mm. I found this at a Goodwill, the Hulk Hogan Thunder Mixer. Oh, it's just a little, like? it's a little battery powered thing that you would mix up your, uh, I guess your your protein shakes in. <laughs> Add the steroids and the spin. Right, yeah, you, <laughs> little powder, little steroids, some milk, mix it all together, brother. You know, if you if you want a weird thing that I have, but I, I wouldn't say I collect it, but I have a Serena Williams doll. That is proudly displayed in my kiss room. Um, uh, I, I've always had a bit of a, a, a attraction to her, and I get I get grief and crap for that all over all these years. But a friend of mine bought it for me as a birthday present, as a largely as a joke. But uh, <laughs> uh, suckers nailed to my wall. But yeah, I don't I don't collect Serena Williams merchandise. But <laughs> you just so say you if anybody's looking for gifts to send to Baco, Serena. Uh, I think Williams. I did say I nailed Serena Williams. Yes, it's official now. Nice. And did you guys have any original career path goals when you were young? I was a journalism major in college. Um, but yeah, the, the overall goal was always music. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I dropped out of college and moved to the Twin Cities because that's where you go when you want to make it big in music. So I, there was some trepidation on my part that probably hurt any chances I ever had at having any real type of career in the music, whether it be behind the scenes things of that nature. I'm obviously still always doing stuff somewhat related to music between the podcast and my own little basement recording studio and, and things of that nature. And, um, but yeah, it was always something like that ever since, I don't know, probably about the age of 10, I was pretty sure I wanted to be a rock star. Uh, as I grew older, my, my expectations changed a little bit, but it was always about doing something with music. So uh, probably I, I am doing it, but nothing in the sense of that I make any money on it. But uh, at this stage of the game, I'm used to it. What about you guys? 
I remember uh, being a young kid and my grand I'd be at my grandparents' house and someone would ask, What are you gonna do? You know, make money. What are you gonna do for a job when you're older? What are you gonna go to school? What are you gonna? and I'd say, I'm gonna be a rock star. And my grandpa would get so mad. And he'd be like, You're not gonna be a rock star. That's what a stupid thing to say. You know, you need to have some realistic goals. And my grandma would say, Yeah, hush now, you just leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> but I was in a little tiny town and had no concept of the real world around me. And so we just dumb kids with instruments. We didn't, we're never going to make it big or do anything. And then I just kind of floated for a while, got some regular jobs and worked in some factories and stuff. And then ended up falling into radio. And I thought I could do that forever. And then, you know, in reality, I look back on it all and I was just waiting for somebody to invent podcasts. Because <laughs> that's what I really wanted to do. I wanted to have a radio show that we could do pretty much anything you wanted to do. Talk about whatever you wanted to talk about. You know, be there. I wanted to, when I worked on radio, I always wanted to talk about the bands that I was about to play or just played, you know, or give information and things like that. But that wasn't really encouraged. It was just like boom, boom, and on to the next, you know. And so I was like, when, when Chris came around with the podcasting thing and I didn't even know what it was, it sounded perfect. So, you know, and then I, you know, I just kind of fell into jobs and stuff. Like I ended up I'm, <laughs> now I'm, I'm pretty high up as a, in a, in a position as a maintenance guy, you know, I fix things in restaurants and, you know, I never knew that I was good at fixing stuff. I just kind of fell into a job doing it and was like, oh, well this shit ain't that hard, you know, and I kind of like figuring out how to fix things, you know, so I don't know. I never really had much of a plan, I guess. Everything just kind of fell into place. Yes. I always grew up wanting to be the guy who made the Sears catalog. <laughs> nice. Yeah. See, I wanted to be a game show host too, but now, now I finally realize my dreams. I do think if you have like kind of that pie in the sky career, you need either that, like you'll never do that kind of people around you or you need support. I mean, I, cause I was more surrounded by apathy. Like it was more like, ah, good luck with that. But anyway, what about you, Chris? Um, I well in my teen years I legitimately almost tried to pursue a career in baseball. I Ooh. I was I was I was a pretty serious player through like junior high and high school and even I even went up to Austin P University up here in Clarksville and did a tryout. It was like an open walk on tryout for the Pittsburgh Pirates and I did okay in the tryout and like there was a few of us that got approached. There was a couple guys that actually got approached to get minor league contracts. I didn't get that. I got offered um, what's called instructional league, which is like below the minor leagues. Hmm. And that day I was all excited, like, wow, I'm going to actually be a baseball player. And then the more research I did on it, I realized, uh, no, this is like, it's the lowest <laughs> one possibly hit. And you don't even really get paid. It's like an internship thing where you have to have a job and then you do, you do a lot of like baseball schooling and it was out in, I think, Durham, North Carolina is where they, they did it at. And wow. it, when I found out the real, like, the non-perks of the job, I was like, okay, there's like a one in a million shot that you'll even get into the minors from it. So, And at that point, I had started playing guitar in bands and stuff. And I was kind of, you know, drifting away from wanting to do sports. And then uh, in college, I, uh, I was a broadcast journalism major. And I was looking into being like a writer because I was really into writing in high school. But... Uh, I was wanting to be like a sports journalist and, you know, interview people from press conferences. And now that I watch press conferences now and realize that you get basically zero good answers, that I'm so glad that I didn't pursue that job because I probably would have killed myself by now because it, it seems just so boring. But, um, yeah, that's pretty much that was what my interests were back in those days. But then once I discovered, you know, playing in rock and roll bands and drugs, that kind of pulled me away from everything. Drugs. Yeah, do, you, it. do you think it would have been helpful if um for but this is a question for both of you actually a little bit because i do like if, if if there would have been somebody who could have been a serious mentor and given you kind of a breakdown of like you know of course you want to be a rock star but here's what's more realistic you can try to be a rock star and when it's all said and done there's a pretty good chance you'll have a job like this and what i'm saying is like maybe if you would have pursued baseball a little further done that mm -hmm. instructional league thing maybe you would have been at a point now where you know let's 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 shoot high a gm or an assistant gm for a team or you know like a a, a well-paid scout or something like that do you think that would have been uh, beneficial or i don't know uh, do you think you, you, you're better off doing what you're doing 
Well, I mean, it, it, I wound up getting what I needed to because, I mean, like I said, I was my interests were kind of drifting away from sports okay. at that time. It was one of those things where it was like I had put in so much work to, as a baseball player that it was like when the tryout came, it was like, well, I should at least try. But I, I kind of went up there reluctantly. And then when they offered it to me, I was got I kind of got reinvigorated. But then when I really stopped and thought about it, I was like, this is really not what I want to do. And it, it, baseball had kind of become like a job anyway. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would, of course, I would, you know, rather than do healthcare billing, having a job in baseball. Would have been <laughs> See, and my whole thing was I just always enjoyed applying for jobs that I had no business applying for, or no experience <laughs> applying for, and seeing what happens. That's how I ended up in radio. Here's something, Chris, you probably didn't even know about me. One time I auditioned, I sent in a tape to, to be a part of the broadcast team for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Oh, yeah? I never heard back. <laughs> I, I have a rejection letter from Mike Tice for the offensive uh, coordinator position of uh, the Minnesota, or offensive quality control position. I don't even know what that is, but I applied for it. Uh, so I remember you I, telling I me about this. that when I came on your show that time. That's awesome. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I got it framed in, uh, right next to the Serena Williams doll. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. At the time that I applied for with the Jacksonville Jaguars, I actually had called a football game, one high school football game. The guy that did it all the time for the radio station was going out one night at the same time I was getting done. And I talked him into letting me come with. And then when I went with, I talked him into letting me help call the game. And we did pretty good together, but I just drank beer the whole time and, you know, just kind of read off the sheet and was hooting and hollering and just trying to add some color to the commentary. And it went really good. And then I was looking around the station and found this advertisement that the Jacksonville Jaguars were looking for somebody. I was like, I can do that. <laughs> You'd be a great uh, football analyst. You know what? They should hire you and I to just do two games a year, the Viking Packer games. Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> Maybe we should do that this year, set up the Skype and do our own commentary for the football game. Yeah, maybe we should send them out as like audition tapes. <laughs> <laughs> you get both sides. Uh-huh. And some fist uh, fights, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> That's a sports. All right. Eric Lucier wants to know, my question is, are you a boob man or a butt man? <laughs> Any preference, Baco? Well, if the Serena Williams tipped you off at all, I'm a boob man. But she, wait, she's got a huge ass, too, doesn't she? Yeah. I'm, I'm a boob man, but there's nothing wrong with a nice ass, either. Yeah, I'm a boob man myself. Hmm. I like boobs. I like butts. I like legs. I like pretty faces. I like Eve. I don't know. I'll take it all, man. i take it all. <laughs> oh, here's another one that must be uh, aimed for Baco. Can you rate the best to worst Ugly Kid Joe albums? Um, I cannot. <laughs> I think I should handle this one also. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say, and this is personal preference for me, which is very, very difficult. I just took the four full-length studio albums. I mean, they had some awesome EPs, too, but... Oh, man, this is almost as hard as the tough question. Um, I'm going to say number one, Motel California. Number two, America's Least Wanted. Number three, Uglier Than They Used to Be. And number four, Menace to Sobriety. But honestly, that's it's all interchangeable with me. I love them albums so much. All of them. Everything. More Ugly Kid Joe, please. And Carlos also thinks we don't talk enough about it, about Faith No More. Hey, you just dropped some early in the show i actually did yeah because i've been listening i love faith no more faith more is one I think of my they're great. all-time favorite bands you know they opened for guns and roses and metallic on that that kind of ill-fated stadium tour yep. um the one where james burned his hand and and i saw the last show that they opened up on that uh, at the metrodome um and uh he said <laughs> he announced that they were getting out of the ring is how they, they said they weren't going to be doing the the rest of the tour but uh they were great uh uh, I love Angel Dust, like you talked about earlier, and um, uh, From Out of Nowhere is, is really good. Uh, and what's the one, uh, King for a Day, Fool for a Lifetime, I think is is better. Also, their, what was the record they did just a few years ago? Um, I thought that was really good. Again, you know, with Faith No More, with me, it's like it's 50-50. Half of their stuff is weird and I can't get into sure. it. And then the other half are these really amazing rock songs that I just can't get enough of. And even that new one was the same thing. I mean, that what was the song? Motherfucker, I think it was called. 
And it's just like, dude screaming motherfucker over and over and over <laughs> again. It's like, I, well, I can't really get into that. But there's a song on there called Matador that's badass. I mean, every Faith No More album, you've almost got the guarantee that there's going to be at least, at least four really killer songs on it. The rest of it might be all weird stuff that nobody understands, but you're always going to get the at least four, usually more, great songs on every Faith No More album. I love Mike Patton as a singer, too, by the way. Shit, yeah, he's one of the best singers out there. Chris, Faith No More? Uh, I like some stuff. I haven't really dove enough into their catalog to have a great opinion on it. I do like Angel Dust was a CD I had back in the day, and I used to listen to pretty regularly. King for a Day, I do like. Um, the Is it the real thing that had the song, the epic song? I, yeah. that That's one, what I, I called it From Out of Nowhere. That's actually the opening song. Yeah, right. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I like some the stu- stuff I like, I really like, but I'm kind of like with Aaron on it where... Some stuff's just a little too bizarre for me. And I got the Mr. Bungle stuff. I, I never could get into that stuff. Yeah, same here. They had that song, Girls of Porn. That was really cool. But a lot of the other stuff was like the stuff in Faith No More that I don't really like. Yeah. What I like about Faith No More is the song off of talking about soundtracks, the Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey soundtrack, Perfect Crime. Great song. It's yeah, an great Amazing tune. song. So yeah, definitely love some faith no more. Mick Watkins wants to know. Mick Watkins of Wild Ride. Give him a like on Facebook. He wants to know, what are your thoughts on the new wave of traditional heavy metal movement? And are you guys fans of bands within the scene, such as Enforcer, Demon Knight, Haunt, Ambush, and Saber? Oh, we we did an entire episode on the, on this topic. Uh, there's a lot of great do bands on that one. As an enforcer, I like a lot. Uh, well, was it the one that on that episode Toledo Steel? Yeah, which they're a band. They're a band from uh, the UK, but they're called Toledo Steel. They're um, they're pretty great. There, there's a lot of good stuff in that category if you check it out. And I'm gonna definitely check out some of those on his recommendations because some of those I hadn't heard of before. There, there's a couple of them on that list that I do know. Night Demon is pretty awesome. They've got a really cool yeah. video for a song called Welcome to the Night that's out there on yep. the YouTube. That's pretty damn awesome enforcer is something else man talk about a great awesome singer with a cool unique voice and a lot of power and a lot of range to it enforcers like that it's like this awesome heavy metal band and this dude can just wail and they look like judas priest from back in the day that's always a plus for me and uh i was gonna look up ambush and so I thought I did, but it actually came up as, <laughs> as a rapper that I had no idea. Oh, I thought you were going to come up with some kind of porn uh, thread here. No, no, it was. A, I was looking stuff up on the YouTube on the music, but uh, mm, yeah, it YouTube, came up as a yeah, rapper right. at first. I was like, "Oh shit, what's this? Oh no!" And then I looked it up again and found a song called "Hellbiter" that is really cool and worth checking out. That's by Ambush. But yeah, definitely want to check out some of that other stuff. I love it. I love it that you know, and I try to explain to people all the time when I'm talking to them about podcasts and what we do. And one of my favorite things to say is, you know, yeah, we, we pay attention and we, we give tribute to all the legends, you know, and we're always going to talk about them. But what most people don't realize is there's a bunch of kids nowadays that are finding their dad's old cassette tapes in the attic, you know, and are discovering some of these bands and are actually, there are actually new bands out there that have the spirit and the sound and the style of the stuff that we love from back in the day, you know, and, and the new wave of traditional heavy metal is the perfect example of that, you know, and I, I just think it's freaking awesome that there's young, new, fresh bands out there that are just amazing, and some of those bands on that list are definitely definitely fit the bill you guys got any I, think other? Ha- I think haunt's badass um but uh, i'm not familiar with too many other ones i'll check that out too all right jace shablewski our good friend he wants to say refresh us listeners on how baco and loose got together for cobras <laughs> well i was at the animal shelter and um him and i both wanted to adopt the same pregnant cat and uh from that point on, we just struck up a friendship and started a podcast. And started a family. Yeah. <laughs> we shared the kittens. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> uh, through Decibel Geek. Yeah, we were both writers. Um, uh, Luce, uh, and the weird thing is, I don't know, do you recall, Chris? I actually reached out to you. I was 
starting to i had an idea for a podcast that i was going to do called uh, two guys and a t-shirt um now i don't know that i ran the title by you but i i, I was asking you for some some uh just early tips on how to record that kind of thing um and that's uh, I don't know if you recall that conversation at all, but it was about a, a month after that that uh, Luce actually had recorded an, an episode or two of Cobras and Fire, and because of, of the writing I had done for Decibel Geek, he, he reached out to me uh, because he was a writer, too, at the time. And just to, to throw it together, we, we recorded a couple episodes, and from that point on, uh, I don't know. It's been just magic. <laughs> I, well, I, I vaguely remember that. I tell you what I do remember um, before Cobras and Fire, the first time I heard of you was your appearance on Rob's show from out of nowhere. Mm, sure. And, and I remember that's the first time I heard of Jesus Chrysler or any, or any of that. And I remember really liking that. And I think, did you approach me about writing for the website? I can't remember. I did. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's why I'm not currently writing for CGCM. I wasn't recruited by Rich. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is, is that an okay joke to say? Uh, I was going to say, yeah, really? No, I, was talking, I yeah. don't understand um, uh, it. I was listening to, fuck, I'm trying to remember what the, because the, uh, through, I, I, I was searching some Eric Carr information. I came across your um uh, interview, like I was Googling it, like your, your your interview with Gary Corbett came up. And um, and from that point on, I don't remember where it was, but I, I started listening to more of your shows, but within, I don't know, five or six episodes, you guys mentioned something to reach out if you needed writers. And I was about a year and a half into Snark at the Moon, and I was ready to kind of do something that would get a little more exposure, so I reached out to you. <laughs> and you found out you weren't going to get more exposure. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I don't know about that. That oh, worked out well. <laughs> That's awesome. And kind of like us, you know, you, the the first host starts the show awkwardly, figures I got to find somebody else to do this with me, and mm-hmm. magic happens. Yeah, if it clicks, it clicks. I mean, it's a, it's, it's been a struggle uh, on the early part. Uh, we've gotten used to debating each other uh, a lot better. I think getting over that hurdle was the probably the biggest thing, especially because I'm such a fucking dick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But no, he's uh, the weird thing is, honest to God, yeah, like he he jokes about it, but you know, you meeting men over forty is kind of weird. I think uh, we 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 quote BJ all the time as like how to make friends after forty is to start a podcast. But <laughs> Devin has become one of my closest friends, you know, um, and, and 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 he is a trusted confidant in my life. And as much as I like to give him a hard time, uh, he's uh, been a, a just a positive influence in my life. And meanwhile, uh, he's you know. Just spiraled. So apparently I had the opposite effect on him. <laughs> That's part of the chemistry. Yes. <laughs> you guys are so sassy together. Uh, uh, Jay also wants to know, how do each of you feel about your NFL team's first round draft picks? Especially Aaron. Oh, why? Yes. Why? <laughs> <laughs> why? <laughs> no, it hasn't been a weird draft for the Packers, has it? Hmm. Uh. Well, I texted you about it the other night about like, ooh, I hope Aaron Rodgers isn't going to get pissy about them drafting a quarterback in the first round. Oh, what are the odds that that guy's not going to get pissy about that? He gets pissy about everything. Come oh. on, I st- I think that they, I'm sure, had run it past him, or maybe even his idea. You know? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. And he's like, cool, do it. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, think about a guy like Rogers. You know, how do you extend your legacy? You know, have a have some kid you can bring in and mentor. You know, and then when you're done, the Packers seamlessly go on. You know, just like Every they did from Favre to Rogers, to, then to, to teach Love, their replacement. And then your legacy lives on forever because then that guy becomes a Hall of Fame quarterback too, and he couldn't have done it without <laughs> you. Much to the chagrin of the uh, fans of the Minnesota Vikings, that's probably how it's going to go. Uh, I will say this, um, just like uh, I, I thought the same thing anytime somebody gets drafted by Green Bay, and that is, I hope you like Applebee's. So. <laughs> That's not, God, that was a solid joke, Aaron. I don't know. <laughs> what, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, I watched the draft. I'm actually a big fan, which is really kind of stupid, but because uh, uh, I don't know any of these players. The reality is is that if they work out, I will love it. And if they don't, then I, I hate it. Right. Um, <laughs> all I'm saying is that like the people that make these picks know way more than I do, so what the fuck? I don't have a whole lot of comment. Um, uh, I, I'm not 
losing my shit that they didn't draft an offensive tackle just because we need one. What if the guys that were available suck? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the thing. You really don't break. know until they start playing. Correct. Chris, how'd the Chiefs do? Uh, I guess I'm okay. I mean, I don't really ever follow college that much, so it's like I'm – I'm basing all of my thoughts on basically the the first impressions of what I saw the other night, but we got Clyde Edwards Hilaire from LSU, the running back. I would have taken Swift out of Georgia instead of him, but uh, Patrick Mahomes wanted this guy from LSU. So if he wants him, great. Uh, we drafted a guy named Willie Gay Jr. in the, in the second round, which I'm sure will lead to a lot of jokes. And um, <laughs> he's also he's he's been in trouble for having somebody else do his schoolwork, and he's punched his quarterback. So hopefully um, he doesn't I have see. to worry about school. he doesn't have to worry about schoolwork anymore. But I hope he doesn't try to punch Mahomes in the face. But uh, I don't know. I mean, we got depth. I mean, the Chiefs are still loaded for next year. So um, all of this is depth, in my opinion. So I still I still like our chances to go back and repeat next year. I think the most exciting thing about the Packers draft is the offensive lineman they got from Michigan, Rockin' John Runyon. <laughs> is he the son of, of John Runyon who played for the Titans? I think so. That's cool. Well, and outside of the players you guys named, every other player drafted was selected by the Vikings because they had 205 picks. So <laughs> That's the way it always goes with the Vikings, up first in the draft and the most picks. Oh, <laughs> Oh, did, did, uh, did you guys see the thing about the, the Raiders? They, th- this is such such a Raiders thing to happen. They show John Gruden sitting in his office during the draft, and his entire draft board is right there behind. Oh dear God! <laughs> I didn't hear that. That's surprising. Yeah, well, not not for the Raiders. It's not. <laughs> I did notice that John Gruden's gut has gotten bigger, and I thought I was looking at myself. I saw your post about that. <laughs> I was like, the giant head, ill-fitting hat, and a beer gut. That's day in the life. We, yeah. All he's, right. a, he's got a better bank account than I do. Well, since we came here to talk about rock and roll and not football, James West has got a good question to get us out of it. Favorite band from the big four thrash bands, and if you could replace one band, who would it be with? So I guess if Slayer's retired... Who goes into that spot? And I think it's easy, and it's obviously overkill. <laughs> nope. No, I, I would put I would put testament. I was going to say if it's not overkill, it's got to be testament, right? Yeah, and I would definitely drop Slayer. I've never been a fan. Oh, Slayer is my favorite. Um, oh. I would probably it just it's it, it sounds stupid because. They're gigantic, but out of those four, I would drop Metallica, and I would probably slide in Testament, but only because he asked me to. I would not. I would keep Metallica over Testament, but I'm okay with the overkill, overkill pick too, to be honest with you. But I don't know. The My big favorite. four does seem pretty much. It, it makes sense, no matter how you feel about. You know any of the given bands, they are the four big ones. Right. Yeah. My fa- my favorite is always going to be Anthrax, though, and I know they're their career is pretty spotty throughout the, all the lineup changes and everything, but I, I still love them. Yeah, same here. I, I love them all, honestly. I do I mean, too. Yeah, it's hard to pick a favorite or a least favorite out of that group because I do love all those bands. Um, you know, Slayer has had a stellar career. Metallica, you can't argue with that. Anthrax, to a lesser extent, but still great. Megadeth, same thing. <sighs> I guess if I, I had to pick I saw one, Overkill for the first time this year. It was fucking amazing. Great otherwise, band. otherwise, if Overkill and Testament wasn't available, maybe I'd put in Suicidal Tendencies. Okay. But we did an episode about that a long, long time ago, but that was a fun one. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, another one from James West. Favorite metal and rock bands from each decade until now, 60s onward. And you have to pick one. I got mine. All right. I'm and, ready with mine whenever you want me to go. In the 60s, I go with The Doors. In the 70s, Kiss, the 80s, Ozzy, the 90s, Ugly Kid Joe, the 2000s, Queens of the Stone Age, and since the 2010s, Ace Fraley. <laughs> hey, he's put out three albums since 2010. Oh, man. So many of mine are, so, so many of my favorites are like lumped into the same decade, so this is hard. Um, right, that's the thing. I guess 60s, I would say. Jimi Hendrix Experience, 70s, 
I'm going to mix it up because I got into Kiss in the 80s. So I'll say for the 70s, uh, Alice Cooper. For the 80s, Kiss. For the 90s, shit. Uh, Pantera. Too fat. And who gives a fuck after that? <laughs> uh, I, for the 60s, I'm going to go with Sabbath. Their first record was 69, correct? Because I yeah. kind of did what you were doing with Kiss there. I wanted to get both of them in there. So 70s is Kiss for me. 80s would be Slayer. Um, 90s would be Soundgarden. I had nothing for the 2000s, but you just mentioned Queens of the Stone Age, Aaron. So I'm going to uh, join you on that. And for the last decade, it would have to be the Glorious Sons. Oh, and I'll say for the last decade, Eclipse. Oh, that's a good one, oh, yeah. too. Yeah. That's good. It's tough to break it down like that. Yeah. Even if you're going to squeak Sabbath into the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does say metal and rock. You know, I mean, I, was, I wasn't I was really comfortable with uh, the Beatles being, you know, I don't know. I guess they're rock, but I don't know. They got their moments. I really, I really just wanted to get Sabbath in there. Yeah. All right. Grayson Gallagos wants to know, if you were a street fighter, what would your theme song be and why? Hmm. Uh, I'd go with Street Fighting Man, but it would be the Ace Fraley version. <laughs> wow. I don't know. That's just off the top of my head. That's a tough one. It's kind of like I'm thinking of like wrestling theme songs, too. What would be a good thing to the way of the ring? I, I, actually, I know what I, I would probably... The, it would only be it would be the breakdown part in domination by Pantera at the end. Oh yeah, better get out there and get fighting quick then. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one to have in your head while you're fighting for sure. Um, let's think of the song "Fight" by Guar. That's just you know, just kind of make you want to beat somebody's brains in. <laughs> Go. I just wanna buy Kiss and kind of rechange the lyrics a little bit. Like I just want to fuck you up. I was gonna say you that's do really cheesy. You do that's read my can. body, so you're nice and agitated for the fight. <laughs> yeah, but you're walking. You're gonna go into a street fight with the line. I've got a body built for sin and an appetite for passion. Well, like I said, you can rework the lyrics a little bit. You know, yeah, you have a to. body built for sin and an appetite for uh, kicking ass or something. Violence. I don't know. <laughs> Got a body built for sin and an appetite for violence. There you go. I don't know. That's a good way to get inside your opponent's head, though, if you just leave it the way it is. They won't know what the hell's coming at them. Yeah. Man, I don't know. There would be a lot. Of, I would, if I was actually like a, like a, a street fighter or whatever he, he wants, a walk-up song is something I would probably spend about nine months debating. <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the way I look at that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, even doing the wrestling stuff, it took me forever, but eventually what I've settled on is Cherokee Boogie by Ace Fraley. Mm, nice. That's what I use every time. That's off that uh, Smell the Fuzz record, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a pretty cool oh. album. I like that. That's when I first realized Billy Corgan was actually a pretty damn good guitar player is when I heard that. Mm, nice. Uh, let's see. Darren Parkin wants to know, will we get a Bruce Kulick and M.O.B. album? If we do, what's MOB by the way? Do you guys know? It's supposed to be MOBB, members of Bruce's band. Oh, uh, okay. okay. I was going to ask that too. If we do, will there be original music on it? Chris, what's I, the word on that? It'll only happen with original music. I don't. I'm, but I, my guess is probably not. What do you guys think? Well, he was, he he did an interview this week with uh, Mike Brown on his show, and he actually said that. They were actually supposed to be in the studio this month to record together. So oh. um, it's definitely being it's being worked on. It's just a matter of when they can get together and do it. And is it um, original music? He didn't say, but I, I I would think that it is. So is that with guys from the band that he played with on the cruise? Yeah, same guys. Nice, but not Bob. <laughs> no, not Bob. Bob's uh, not invited. Bob's not gonna be in the band anymore. That sucks. <laughs> Once again, he gets fucked. Again. Crazy Bob has to fucking go home without nothing. It's almost baseball season. He'll be okay. Okay. You know, one other thing I always thought about Bruce Kulick, which I thought would be cool, but has never happened, and I doubt it'll ever happen, is if they took the current lineup of Grand Funk and did a new album with Bruce playing on it. Hmm. You know, I know people have wanted that for a long time. Do it in the vein of what 
what should this be as far as a grand funk album you know try to write it in the vein of you know the way if if grand funk the originals were going to release an album what would the songs be like in 2020 yeah i know that he's been asked that in interviews and he i think he's game for it but i think the rest of the guys in the band just don't see a point in doing it yeah well because that's because he replaced the guy that writes songs (laughs) yeah that's true mark farner's not in the band anymore yeah yeah, I guess it would be kind of tough then to, you know, replicate some classic grand funk without him. I think Mark Farner and Ace Frehley should start a band. I'd say that. I was waiting for a punchline. <laughs> I didn't know if there was going to be <laughs> one. Like, yeah, fuck Bruce Kulik is what the band's called. <laughs> <laughs> couple of questions left and then it's game show time nice. um jeff reed wants to know best ozzy guitarist is it randy rhodes jakey lee or zach wild oh no joe holmes option huh um <laughs> <laughs> i think when you got these uh, I, three on the list that goes without saying I, well, what about I, andrew watt <laughs> oh god um i think you gotta go with randy to, to this day i love them all though yeah. I think as a player, God, man, it's 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 really close because they're all amazing. I do think Randy's probably the best player, but Jakey e. Lee, hands down to me, was the best fit in Ozzy. And I know that's sacrilege to a lot of people. And um, or, I don't know, man, maybe not because Zach really seems to gel with Ozzy. Ah, you can't go wrong with any of them, but my personal favorite, favorite is Jake. that's that's tough man that's a hard one because each one of them is perfect for their own era of the band you know and up to this point you know ozzy's guitarist was probably the most coveted spot in rock because it's a legendary position to be in but man if i'm looking at the albums that they all played on i just could never walk away from those randy rhodes albums so i'm going with randy okay All right, so here's one that is definitely for Baco. It's from Andrew Jacobs. After the stay-at-home order is lifted, will there be any more Chipotle challenges? And while the order is in effect, will there be virtual Chipotle challenges, possibly with Chris and Aaron? Um, Well, you can't virtually do it. Well, maybe explain what a Chipotle challenge is. is. Okay, well, the, the Chipotle challenge was uh, uh, an idea I threw out on the podcast where um, you basically go to a Chipotle restaurant, but you only drink beer. You don't order food. You don't do anything other than – and you, you drink as many beers as they'll sell you and, and to see if there's a, like a point where they cut you off and see how they react, that kind of thing. So we did one with um, uh, Gene Vogel and Andy Shaw. Uh, and I recorded the whole thing on like a little Zoom recorder, and we threw it up as kind of bonus footage, unedited, all that good stuff. Um, but you can't really, cause the whole point of it is to just be out there in the public in a situation where the, the, the reason it appealed to me is because like, it's ridiculous to go to a Chipotle and get drunk. And, <laughs> and yeah, I, and that was what it, uh, I thought was attractive about it. Um, and so that you can't really do that virtually. Um, as to will there be more, if he's asking me if I'll go day drinking with Andy and Gene again at any time, we're, uh, we're all local here and uh, they're good friends. But I would, I, I, I initially, and I, I continue to throw it out there, I'm open to anybody doing their own Chipotle challenges. And Andrew, if you, if you find a way to, re- if you do it and you find a way to record it, send me the audio. We'll throw it up as bonus footage. You know what I mean? Uh, or a bonus episode. Uh, and, and that's for anybody out there, honestly, it, it was, it, what's the worst thing that could happen? You have a few beers with some friends, so. And get kicked out of Chipotle. <laughs> <laughs> I was disappointed. Like, Chipotle employees didn't bat an eye. It was the customers. Once the beer empty started piling up, that they were the ones that were like, huh, what's going on over there? It's two in the afternoon. Look at those guys. But uh, Yeah, uh, I love the, the, the part where you talk about you talk about the guy giving you <laughs> the stink eye. <laughs> yeah. It definitely happened. That's funny. All right. And the final question for this quarantine session comes to us from my favorite comedian, Courtney Cronin Dold. And this one's also for you, Baco. She wants to know Will Jesus Chrysler have a song about quarantine coming out anytime soon? Well, Courtney, that's a great question, um, as Eddie Trunk would like to say. Um, 
if you guys, uh, there is actually a song we're working on. If 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 you if it's okay, I'll, I'll give you just a sample of it right now. Yeah, you please. Guys with that? Yeah, yeah. All right, here we go. All right, <clears throat> it's called the Quarantine Age Blues. I can keep my hands clean, but it won't wash my dirty mind. I can keep six feet away from you, but I'll still undress you with my eyes. I got the quarantine age blues. I can't go shopping for new shoes. Quarantine age blues. That's, that's, that's for now. It's a little bit of a departure for us, but wow! It's, uh, World it's podcast progress. premiere. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, nothing will ever top the Maggie Mae Vinnie Vincent cover, though. Oh, yeah. That, <laughs> that was, was, that awesome. was uh... <laughs> <laughs> That was so about... funny. I played it for my wife, and even she thought it was funny. <laughs> I actually made a scene at work laughing in my cubicle with that song. <laughs> uh, that, that, that warms the cockles. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah glad that was definitely liked... what had yeah, me cracking up, too. Yeah, too funny. Well, I guess while we're talking about music, it's a good time for me to remember to tell you that all the music you're hearing today is from the brand new Fargo Strut album. All the music you're hearing except for what you just heard just then. But the intro music, I'm going to play a full track on the way out of the show. It's brand new album, Fargo Strut. Can't Cool Down is in the name of the album. Uh, you know what? Like Fargo Strut on Facebook. They're a great band. You've heard us play them and talk about them before. This new album is killer. And here's something you want to know. If you're a KISS music completist, well, a member of the tree is on this album. Talking about Jeremy Asbrock from the Gene Simmons band and the Ace Fraley band. He plays on a track on here. So if you got to have it all, you're going to need this album. Like Fargo Strut on Facebook, and that's where you can get the CD too. Chris, I've got one here for myself, but Billy also sent one for you too. I know I can well, eventually when I get to come to your house I'll pick it up and I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> to, I love that name. I'll have to remail it to you. Yeah, yeah. Fargo Strut's an awesome band. I like them a lot. This new album's really killer. Okay, let's see. Time to load up the trivia questions. Cause if you guys are ready, we can do it. It's time for another edition of Beat the Geek. <clears throat> nice. I I, I talked to Chris a couple days ago. I told him I was going to be all cocky, but the reality is now I'm starting to cower. I, I have no chance. I, uh, I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna go down like a, a Wisconsin woman in a bar at 1.30. Oh, Jesus. PM. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Hey, look, I, I'm no one to, to make fun of people for day drinking. That's pretty much my only thing. That's my only hobby nowadays. I saw I saw a great thing the other day. It was like if this quarantine has taught me anything, it, it, it's taught me that you don't need to have fun to have alcohol. <laughs> nice. Boom! There's the line of the decade. <laughs> All right. Well, if you guys are ready, you know the rules. Eleven questions. That's how this show rolls. I've gathered up awesome questions. They're going to be tough. I got some really hard kiss questions for the kiss round. Are you guys ready? Yep. Yep. All right, Chris, you're the geek that is trying to defend himself from being beaten, so you will go first. The first question in Beat the Geek this week is this. Which member of the Who was the first to release a solo album? So, Baco, you know the way it goes. You got a chance to bet against him before he hears the choices. What do you think? Does he know his Who? Yeah, pro I'm going to say he knows this one because I do. All right, Chris, your choices are... You know him, John and Twistle, Roger Daltrey, Pete Townsend, or Keith Moon. It's going to be a total guess on my part. I don't know a lot about the Who. Um, I'll say Pete Townsend. That is incorrect. Mm. Baco should have bet against him. You say you know the answer? Yeah, it wasn't a Keith Moon. That's so incorrect. It was actually oh. John and Twistle was the first one to release a solo album. Hmm. Well, and apparently I didn't know it either. So you thought you did. You should have bet against I was pretty, yourself. I was pretty positive, though. I had a lot of confidence. I was too. I when I looked it up, I thought Pete Townsend would have been the obvious one that would have released first. But actually, it was in Twistle, then Townsend, then Daltrey, and finally in '75, Keith Moon. 
All right. So first question out of the way, no points awarded. We're still zero, zero. As I told you guys, this would end up this week at the end of the show too. All right, Baco, you ready for your first question? Absolutely. Bring it. All right. This also classic rock question. During the riots at the 1969 Altamont Free Concert Festival, where four concert goers lost their lives, all of these bands bravely played their sets, except for one who refused to take the stage. Chris, do you think Baco knows it? Uh, I'm not sure if he knows it. I know this one. Um, I'll say he knows it. All right. He's not betting against you, Baco. Your choices. All four of these bands were scheduled to play. One of them backed out because they were scared. Was it A, the Rolling Stones, B, the Grateful Dead, C, Santana, or D, Jefferson Airplane? The Grateful Dead. That is correct. The Grateful Dead were actually, I don't know if you call them chicken, they probably were actually pretty smart. (laughs) But they saw what was going on after the lead singer of Jefferson Airplane got his face punched in by a Hell's Angel, decided, yeah, we're, we're going to hit the road. Yeah, the whole thing was a mess. Yeah, bad mess. But I that was, was a guess. I, I, I should be clear. <laughs> I did not know that uh, factually. Like, which of these four bands are the biggest chickens? Oh, clearly <laughs> that must be the Grateful Dead. They got a lot of grief for that. I remember reading about that. The show must go on is how most bands approach this stuff. Uh, at least they did. Right. And they could have maybe helped the situation. Could have maybe got everyone to calm down. <laughs> or leave. Or leave. You know, they, yeah. If, if they're not on acid, they probably would have just be left. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, everyone there was on acid. Oh, okay. Well. All right. Well, you got a point off of that because Chris did not bet against you. Now you're in the lead with one point, and it is Chris's turn. Chris, you ready? All right, let's move into the 80s with these. Which of the following albums does not feature keyboard legend Don Airy? Baco, does, he, does Chris know his Don Airy? I'm going to go no. All right, Chris, he's betting against you. Two points on the line. Your choices are Rainbow, Difficult to Cure, Ozzy, Blizzard of Oz, Black Sabbath, Never Say Die, or Dio, Holy Diver. Mm. I'm going to say Dio Holy Diver. That is correct. And since Baco oh, bet yeah, against you. said that, I was like, can I change it? <laughs> <laughs> if you know Dio's lineup, you already had a keyboard player. Uh, well, technically on Holy Diver, it was Jimmy Bain playing keyboards. It wasn't until the next well, it album. It wasn't Claude? It wasn't until the next album that Claude Schnell came on. Fair enough. So you, Regardless. You read into this. it too far. I consider shit like that when I write these questions. <laughs> you are very good. All right. That's two points for Chris as he takes the lead. Now to Baco's next question. Are you ready? Yep. In 1985, Tina Turner won the Grammy for Best Female Rock Vocal Performance. All of the following were also nominated except got four ladies here. Three of them were nominated. One was not. Chris, does Baco know this one? Uh, I'll say he knows it. All right. Not betting against you. Baco, your choices are Bonnie Tyler, Lita Ford, Stevie Nicks, Wendy O. Williams. What was the category? Grammy for the best female rock vocal performance in 1985. Um, Wendy O. Williams. That is incorrect. Wendy Williams actually was nominated along with Lita uh, Ford Lita? and Bonnie Tyler. Stevie Nicks was the one. Uh, that's a good question. All right. So Chris yeah, did not bet against you. Believe it or not, Wendy Williams was, Grammy- was nominated for a Grammy <laughs> and no nice. points awarded. So the score remains 2-1. You know two what? I took one. the bait. That was just too obvious that it couldn't have been wrong. Yeah. There you go. Mm. My bad. Good question, Aaron. Thank you. All right, Chris, your turn. Number five. This future member of the cult is mentioned in the lyrics of the 1989 Anthrax song, Friggin' in the Riggin'. Baco, does he know his Anthrax? Yes. All right, Chris, your choices are Matt Sorum, James Kotak, John Tempesta, Chris Wise. Was it John Tempesta? That is correct. 
Yes. Because Tempesta was a roadie for Anthrax. Yeah. Oh, that was a hard question, though. All right. Not making them easy for Beat the Geek. Score now is 3-1, to one, Chris. But it's Baco's turn. Actress Emma Roberts is known for her roles on American Horror Story and playing the role of Nancy Drew in the 2007 movie. She's also the stepdaughter of this rocker. Chris, does Baco know the answer to who is Emma Roberts' stepdad? Uh, I'll say he knows it. All right, he's not betting against you, Baco. Your choices are James Lomenzo of White Lion, Warren Demartini of Rat, Kelly Nichols of L.A. Guns, or Danny Stagg of Kingdom Come. Oh, man. Do you know who Emma Roberts is? I do. Uh, can I get the three names, uh, the four names again? Yep. James Lomenzo of White Lion, Warren Demartini of Rat, Kelly Nichols of L.A. Guns, or Danny Stagg of Kingdom Come? Uh, um, Danny Stagg? That is incorrect. The correct answer is Kelly Nichols of L.A. Guns is Emma Roberts' stepdad. Wow. The things you learn during Beat the Geek. <laughs> useless, useless things. No points awarded. All right. So all that brings us back to Chris for question number seven. The demos that got the Sea Hags signed to Chrysalis Records in 1988 were co produced by Sylvia Massey and this successful guitarist. Baco, this is pretty obscure. You think he knows it? Well, I got well, to start trying to get some points. I'm going to say no. All right, Chris. Pressure's on. Baco's betting against you. Your choices are this. Izzy Stradlin, Kirk Hammett, Joe Perry, or Ingve Malmsteen? Who was a strong supporter of the Sea Hags? I know there's like a lot of ties to Guns N' Roses with this band, so I'm going to say Izzy Stradlin. That is incorrect. Believe it or not, the co producer on the Sea Hags demos was Kirk Hammett of Metallica. Wow, that's a hard question. All right. Since Baco bet against you and you got it wrong, Baco gets a point. Smart move right there because it brings you back two to three. And if you heard that noise, then you know it's time for the kiss round. <laughs> Baco, are you ready for your kiss round question? I am. Double the points. Here we go. On Kiss's 1979 Return of Kiss tour for the Dynasty album, the band only played one British Columbia date in Vancouver. Which Canadian band opened for Kiss at that show? Chris, you going to bet against him on this one? No. All right, Baco, here are your choices. Canadian bands. Loverboy, Bachman-Turner Overdrive, Rush, or Chilliwack? Um, Loverboy. That is correct for double points. Baco takes the lead four to three. Ooh. Very nice, Baco. Was that a guess or did you know that? That was a guess. That was a good guess. Chili Wags? <laughs> I don't know that, that bad. I know, I know Chili Wag is like way revered in Canada, but I don't know nothing about them. Okay. All right, Chris. Your kiss round question is this. In a 1983 interview... The host makes the statement, everyone says you are a bizarre bunch of guys, but I think you look like you're all-American and typical boys next door. To which Vinnie Vincent replies, Baco, you think he knows what Vinnie Vincent's got to say to that? Oh, there are only three notable Vinnie Vincent quotes, so I'm going to say yes. <laughs> All right, Chris, he's not betting against you, so for double the points, your choices are, did Vinnie reply, not not for double the points. No, it's still double the points because it's the kiss round. Oh, whoa, whoa, sorry. Gotcha. All right, Chris, here are your choices. Did Vinny say, this boy is going to rock the boy or girl next door, the boys people love to hate, or the boy that steals the show? It was the boy or girl next door. That is correct. In the kiss round, that gives you two points, bringing the score up five to four. 
Did you know that, or did you just kind of figure it out based on context? <laughs> no, I didn't know that one. Okay. I was kind of surprised when I saw that. It was like, well, I guess I'm not really surprised at all. But even way back then, Vinnie Vincent was saying weird shit. <laughs> I can imagine them guys looking at him after every interview going, why did you say that? What are you talking about? And he said, give me $5,000 and I'll answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, this is a damn close game. The score is 5-4 to four, coming out of the kiss round with Chris ahead by only one point. And now, Baco, your chance to bring it back. Are you ready? Yep. Known best for their 1996 hit single, Cumbersome, the band Seven Mary Three <laughs> found inspiration from this TV show when choosing their name. Chris, I think you know how Baco feels about the band Seven Mary Three, but do you think he knows the answer to this question? I do not think he knows the answer to this question. All right, Baco. One of your favorite bands of all time. Was it the TV show MASH, G.I. Joe the Animated Series, Chips, or Knight Rider? It was Chips. That is correct. And Chris bet against you. So that's two points. Puts you back in the lead six to five. I think Seven Mary Three was like the call signal for Yeah, me. yeah, Seven Mary Three like in the in the C B there. I even think it's in the intro. See, he, do, he does know his Seven Mary Three. <laughs> he knows his chips. All right. Here we go. Final question. And for the first time in the show history, it really comes down to this final question. And the question is yours, Chris. Before joining Guns N' Roses in 1991, Gilby Clark was a member of the Los Angeles band Kill for Thrills alongside the son of this rock legend. Baco, for the win, do you think he's got it? He's got this one. All right, Chris, your choices are John Kay of Steppenwolf, Ray Manzarek of The Doors, John Fogarty of CCR or Mike Nesmith of the Monkees? Mike Nesmith. That is correct. Holy shit, we've got a tie. All right. Um, I had not anticipated ever having a tie. <laughs> uh, oh, well. Me, so I'll, I'll for, take a tie. Since there's no prize on the line other than honor and prestige, you guys can share it. Congratulations. You guys both <laughs> won Beat the Geek. That was fun. Not I'm bad. The geek. Not bad at all. Good job, guys. You did pretty good on that. Better than I thought you would. Thanks. And, uh, and coming in future episodes, tiebreaker questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's probably a good idea. I hadn't anticipated that happening. <laughs> Frankly, I couldn't be happier with the outcome. <laughs> you guys should both be very proud of yourselves. Some damn hard questions, Aaron. Oh, they were good, man. I would like to know if listeners are enjoying the Beat the Geek show because I haven't really gotten much feedback on it that I've heard. I've heard a couple people have messaged me and said they dug it, but I haven't heard anybody on the Facebook page talking about if they like Beat the Geek or not, so that's your challenge for this week, other than, of course, sweet reviews and recommendations. I want to know if you guys are digging this or not. Otherwise, we'll just scrap it, but I'm having fun getting the questions together and grilling you guys every single week, but yeah, you guys did awesome today. That was very cool. I think it's great. I love it. Right. Yeah, I, I, have a, I have a great time doing it every week. I'm, I'm glad you came up with the idea. And I'm having fun learning stuff and trying to put you guys down. Yeah, <laughs> you, you really do come up with great questions. All right. Well, awesome. So I guess that's our quarantine session for today. I guess we're going to still be in quarantine next week. And Baco spoiled it for everybody because we're going to have his co-host from Cobras and Fire loose cannon on with us next week so i'm looking forward to that but baco man always awesome to hang out with you to see you it sucks we're not going to see you this summer at rock and pod but it was great to have you on the show with us today uh ditto man i love both you guys uh you know i i i say it enough but probably in the back of my head not enough we really appreciate uh all the help you've given us over the years for the, as far as the show but uh to 
both you guys, you know, to, I really appreciate the fact that you guys are someone I can call friends. You're just, you know, solid individuals. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful to finally be on your program. But it, it took loose cannon begging you to let me be, uh, I guess. So uh, I'll have to, like, maybe lean on him a little harder. Well, yeah, because shit. because the way it went down is we actually went to Loose Cannon first, and he said the only way he'd do it <laughs> is if we let you come on first. No! 